Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening to all the people who are joining online from all over the world. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you at this event, international event. It's one of the first hybrid events we are doing. Uh, we are slowly venturing into the hybrid events now. And uh, this one, we wanted to make a special effort to get all of you here, especially the, all the people who are going to speak on Earth observation, because it's an eclectic gathering of a lot of people whom we have been listening to and interacting in many forums uh, all over the world. And I think it'll be good to see all of you and network with you, because we are at a very interesting stage in our uh, work right now, where the demand for you know, uh, all kinds of investments in agriculture and food is increasing at all levels especially in countries which are facing food crisis. And uh, we find that data is becoming a very important part of how we uh, respond to that food crisis. Preparedness is very important. Early warning is very important. And uh, I think uh, we, we really feel that the Earth observation will become a very important variable in how we do these programs in future. Just to let you know that we have currently now 53 investments in 38 countries which have focused on data and digital agriculture and innovations. It's almost like $1 billion of investment in data and digital agriculture being made. This is on data platforms, innovation platforms, big data systems, open data platforms and all. And I think uh, this deliberation today of all the people who are going to speak to us plus the, all the people who are going to interact I think is a very important event which will bring all the expertise on this under one place. We have been also doing a whole sort of knowledge and learning events under the What's Cooking Data and Digital Agriculture series. Post-COVID, we have done 79 webinars uh, on, on various topics with thought leaders, CEOs, innovators, startups, companies there. So we have been engaged in a very active process of knowledge and learning, and we also offered an open learning campus uh, first uh, digital course on data and digital agriculture, so subscribed by almost 6,000 people all over the world, which is, we were amazed at the response we got to that. So there is traction in, in both the real world and the digital world and virtual world on these topics, and uh, I would now uh, kick, kick us off today um, by requesting my colleague and our uh, practice manager for global engagement for agriculture and food global practice, uh, Julian Lampetti, to kick us off and make inaugural remarks. Over to you. Thank you very much, Parmesh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Good evening uh, to those on the other side of the world. Now, I have an observation I wanted to share with everyone, which is, um, most of you are sitting as far away as you possibly can from the head of the table here. And I'm curious if that's a unique feature of people working on Earth observation and the fact they look, like to look at things from a, a great distance. You know, most of the people in this room are actually not even here. They're somewhere else in the world. And then the, those of you that are here are sitting all the way on the other side of the table. So if you want, over the course of the day, please feel free to come closer to this end. Um, the world is in a crisis. We have more hungry people today than we have ever had before. I'm not sure what language that is, but if you could mute yourself, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, we are completely off track to deliver on SDG2, a world free of hunger. You know, we see the that- is muted. We cannot hear what you're saying. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Um, just, I'll keep going. Okay. It's really it's ruining my rhythm here. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Um, but we should check with the online people a little bit that there's some technical hitch in people not being able to hear. Julian, I know you want to get going. I just want to make sure that people who are away from us are able to hear us as well. 
Can, can anyone confirm online that you can hear us? Okay. Okay. I just want to they confirm. unmuted. So just write in the chat if if you guys online yeah. can hear us. Because this happens. Mm -hmm. Sharon says they can hear. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So as I was saying, we are wildly off track on SDG two, and the problem is getting worse. So we started going off track as early as 2015. If you look at the data, the number of hungry people started increasing. Well, the number of poor people was still decreasing and is still projected to decrease, which tells you the problem is concentrated in certain areas. Now, we produce more food than we have ever produced before. The world does. Maybe there's a slight decrease due to a drought in one year, but overall, it's been a substantial increase over the last decade. And what does this tell us? This tells us that we have this huge problem of growing inequality and unequal distribution. And it's one we can't really understand unless we step back about 2,000 kilometers and look at it. And that is why all of you are so important to this, is because Earth observation is a really unique opportunity to look at this problem and help solve it from a vast distance. Now, the problem isn't just about producing enough food, it's about getting the food in the right place, but even more so, it's about changing the way we produce our food, and Earth observation can be vital to that. Our food production system is a leading source of greenhouse gases, about a third of them. It's a leading source of loss of biodiversity, it's a leading source of environmental pollution. It's a leading source of bad diets, on and on and on. I can tell you all the bad things it does. Yet it has the potential to be leading sink of greenhouse gases incredibly cost effectively. A leading way to clean environmental pollution and to clean water. And again, you can reverse all of those negatives and turn them into positives with our food system. And being able to understand that system from 2,000 kilometers up is really critical to providing people with the tools to do that. Now, let me get into some specifics here. The first is uh, the importance of interoperability. So we need all of that data from our satellites to be merged and to talk to data from the tractors and from other things that are out there so that we can really improve the quality of the, of the data that's out there so we can do better analysis. We need more open data. That means share the toys, make sure the toys are available for everyone. You know, we cannot live by the toddler's credo of what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. We all have to put our data out there and make sure it is accessible to everyone. And with that will come massive amounts of innovation. The cheaper we can make it and the easier we can access it, it's something like 10% of all the data produced from Earth observation devices is actually used. You know, if we can put that data out there in a form that's more accessible and more understandable than others and they can innovate with it, maybe there would be a lot more innovation and transformation of that food system to do more of the good things and less of the bad things that I was talking about. Skills. We need more people with skills. We're interested in investing in that. The countries are investing in that. You guys are the data scientists. You guys understand how to use this data. Help us make this something where we can transfer these skills. And then lastly, how do we put the foundational data sets together so that people can cross-check and believe in the kind of stuff that we're bringing from the satellites? So we're delighted to have you all here. This is a really uh, important opportunity to share your experiences and then figure out how together we can leverage the $1 billion a year the bank is putting into this space. We can solve what I think is the defining challenge that we have today, which is how do we produce 
our food in a way that we don't have more hungry people than ever and that does not destroy our planet as we go. With that, thank you very much and I look forward to your deliberations. Thank you very much, Julian, for kicking us off. And uh, I'm glad to see 75 people right now joining us online and a warm welcome to all of you uh, from where you are, from what I see, you are from all parts of the world. We have a strong earth size community developing, which is working with our programs, and all of them are also equally interested in knowing how we can work on this together. Uh, I would now uh, like to invite uh, our manager of uh, the two big partnerships, the Korea World Bank Partnership Facility and the China World Bank Partnership Facility, which is supporting this event, actually, right now. Uh, and she is managing both these two partnerships uh, Alexandra, Sasha, over to you. Um, thank you, Parmesh. So, um, yes, uh, thank you, everyone. And I'd like to congratulate the World Bank's Agriculture and Food Global Practice on launching the collaboration and using Earth observation data for, for food security monitoring. So today I'm speaking in my capacity as the China World Bank Partnership Facility Program Manager, and um, it's called CWPF. Um, and uh, this is the initiative that provided funding uh, for this workshop and the work uh, that will be taking place. And this is a unique opportunity <clears throat> to bring together Chinese advances in the field of Earth observation with the World Bank's ability to deliver knowledge, resources, and partnerships to the clients across the globe. The activity will inform the growing demand from the World Bank client countries toward the use of data and digital agriculture across different areas. A few words about CWPF. It was established in 2015 as a single donor trust fund, which means there is one donor, and that's China. And so far, the government of China provided uh, about $50 million. And we are currently in discussion about the next phase, and we hope that agriculture and food security will be featured in the next phase as well. And the objective of CWPF is to assist World Bank Group member countries in achieving inclusive and sustainable economic growth. CWPF um, is uh, relevant and it's emblematic of the partnership that China and the World Bank have had for over 40 years. And knowledge um, and learning has been central um, as a theme to this partnership. And the World Bank Group has facilitated sharing Chinese development experience such that World Bank Group client countries can learn from China's progression uh, from a low-income developing country and a major borrower to an upper-middle-income country that it is today, and also an important IDA contributor and IFC mobilization partner. The collaboration today was funded, as I said, by CWPF, but it was done in recognition to the demand for addressing the food security crisis and the World Bank's unique ability to do so. And it will support the development of actionable food security monitoring and response capacities for a number of FCV countries through improved access to food security related data and analytics tailored to their circumstance. Um, the methods that will be created through this collaboration will contribute to better knowledge about data driven policies for food security response and resilience to shock globally. Today's event is the first one in a series of knowledge events that will be organized as part of this collaboration. The Chinese experience has much to offer to emerging economies that are eager to develop robust systems to monitor and address food security crisis. As an example, China's CropWatch program, led by the Institute of Remote Sensing and Digital Earth at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, is a comprehensive crop monitoring system that has been in operation since 1998. It is designed to provide timely, reliable, and independent predictions to crop conditions and production on multiple spatial scales. CropWatch monitors with different levels of granularity indicators for 31 countries encompassing more than 80% of both production and exports of maize, rice, soybean, and wheat. I'm delighted to see that Dr. Hongwei Zhang from CropWatch uh, is among the speakers today. I believe that this collaboration has tremendous potential for strengthening food security monitoring capacities in the countries with scarce data availability, and I look forward to collaborating with the World Bank teams and our <coughs> Chinese counterparts to leverage the power of technology to address emerging data needs. Thank you. 
thank you very much, Sasha, so for kicking, kicking us off, and Julian both for kicking us off. I think we just set the context for why we are here. And now I think uh, we will move to the business end of, of the event in which uh, we have different segments. And the, the session two, um, session one is about uh, really getting uh, a global overview of uh, earth observation data, which many important institutions are working on this for quite some time. And uh, these are, you know, uh, I think I'll introduce each one of them as we come in. Each of them will speak for 15 minutes each, and then we will have a half an hour uh, kind of Q&A uh, discussion, both from the online participants. We would request you to start putting your questions in chat as the presenters are presenting, and I will also take questions from the audience here uh, to s so that we start the discussion part, because the purpose here is to learn, uh, engage, and network. This is the purpose here, and we would like at the end of it to understand which issues we should be focusing on as we go forward. We would also like to build some uh, partnerships with the people who are in this room and the other people who are online. And we would also like to see what this agenda would look like as we work on this for the next uh, two or three years. So uh, let me now bring in Inba Baker Rachel. Uh, those of you who have worked in this field know Inba well. She's uh, been working on the Earth Observation Agenda for a very long time. Uh, Inba is the program director for NASA Harvest, and NASA Harvest is one of the most leading organizations in Earth Observation here. And Inba is joining us online, and uh, so I would request Inba to uh, make the presentation now. Uh, warm welcome to you, Inba, and over to you. Great. Thank you very much um, for that introduction. It's a delight to be here and very much appreciate the invitation. And I'm sorry I'm not able to be with all of you there in person. I think the introduction remarks um, were very relevant and well stated. And, and I think I probably don't even need to talk about this slide, um, but really just highlighting that we really are in a critical period today in terms of our food security. And it remains one of the biggest challenges of our time. We know we're just getting, um, as Julian said, just further and further away from SDG2. And therefore, innovation in how we develop and monitor global agricultural lands is absolutely critical. And satellite data, as was said, holds tremendous potential um, for helping us do that. And so, um, as I understand, the audience here is some uh, Practitioners, of course, that, that are um, very well known in, in the remote sensing side, and then others that are really learning about what the potential and what the, the impacts are. And so I'll try to address both of those. Um, but where we've seen recent major advances in satellite technologies and cloud compute and machine learning and AI models and GPS technologies and other related to digital technologies, these are really transforming the agricultural sector and are enabling us cost-effective monitoring of nearly every field across the globe on a near daily basis, and also enabling us to track changes over the past several decades, owing to the long-term archives of, of satellite data as well. And so here I've listed some of the main areas where remote sensing is and can make a significant contribution. And I'll try to give some examples of just a few of these areas. And so, being able to to work on these uh, impact is, is really the mission of the international G20 initiative called GeoGlam and of NASA Harvest. And ultimately, the goal is to help to advance the adoption of Earth observations to benefit food security, agriculture, and sustainability across the globe, and helping us to bridge gaps between scientific findings and practical implications. And so where GeoPlam is the international framework that um, is focused on international coordination across the activities of this community, and you'll hear from several different GeoPlam partners throughout the day, uh, NASA Harvest is NASA's Global Food Security and Agriculture Program, and it's NASA's contribution into the GeoPlam program. And so to enable this mission, nearly all applications of satellite information for agriculture build on various satellite-driven foundational agricultural products, uh, as Julian referred to. 
Um, and these include things like crop land and crop type maps, field boundaries, yield management practices, like um, when with planting dates or harvesting dates or tillage, etc. And in most countries, these kinds of data products are not publicly available. Um, they're not produced on a consistent and open uh, way. Yet these data could actually be really groundbreaking and enable a large suite of both public and private sector applications to develop and ultimately help support more sustainable and productive food systems. My, sorry, my slides weren't advancing. And so here are some examples of various um, crop land and crop type maps that are available, including from GeoGlam, from the ESA World Serials that was recently released and from uh, our own work under NASA Harvest. And I'll say that the, the community is progressing very fast towards improving the accuracy, the timeliness, and the accessibility of these kinds of products. But nevertheless, there's still a huge need to be able to enhance their consistent production, the capacity to develop these, the benchmarking and accuracy assessments, um, and their availability and also the data collection, the ground data that's really critical for being able both to develop these models and to validate them. And this is really particularly important for mapping smallholder agricultural systems that are much more complex and challenging. Um, and this has been a, a large area of focus for many teams that you'll hear from today, including from uh, our side on, on the NASA Harvest side. Um, and we've been working with several different partners to be able to transition these kinds of capabilities, including with the Kenya Space Agency that you'll hear from more later today. So ultimately, the goal is to be able to translate these kinds of data products into actionable information in support of agricultural and food security decisions. And for this to be impactful and successful over the long run, their application has to be co-developed. It's got to be driven by those who are going to use these data. It's not helpful if somebody overseas um, on the other side of the world is developing products, even if they're great, they're very accurate. There's no reason why a government would use those if they weren't involved in developing these products and, and, and driving them. Um, and we've got to be thinking about also from the start of different projects, the long-term sustainability and the applications and, and what will be uh, needed ultimately in the long-term to sustain these and including the ground information. So taking these kinds of tools and information products, we can start to apply them to inform decisions and to help reduce uncertainty in crop estimate, estimates throughout the growing season. And so this is um, what I'm showing here is a major initiative under GeoGlam called the Crop Monitor. It was developed in response to a request by the G20 AMIS community and the early warning community to provide consensus-driven crop condition assessments that are easily understood by non-remote sensing communities and by policy communities. And so um, this brings together for the first time over 40 different national and international organizations, several of which again are represented in this workshop. Um, to provide operational monthly global assessments of major commodity and food security crops. And so we publish these um, in two uh, monthly operational bulletins, and we've recently actually started to bring together those of the major um, uh, production export countries under the AMIS crop monitor and those focused on the early warning countries into one global monitor, recognizing the interconnectedness of our food system and that it's important to actually be looking at this at a, at a global scale with, with uh, covering the, the full globe. Um, and so recognizing the value of this kind of a system of, of the crop monitors, we've been working with different regional and national entities to be able to adopt and adapt and build on this crop monitor system for countries to develop their own monitoring systems driven by their own national needs integrated into their own bulletins and information systems. And this is similar to the efforts that you'll hear more about also um, from China Crop Watch, which has been doing a tremendous amount of work on, on this kind of work as well. Um, this is another recent example of a partnership between FAO, the Ministry of Agriculture of Malawi and NASA Harvest to advance yield forecasting and in-season crop condition monitoring in Malawi in support of the government. Um, and actually tools that were developed under this project, which was ongoing, were then used in April 2023 uh, to assess the impact of Cyclone Freddy on agriculture and food security in the southern part of Malawi that was hit hard, um, where they estimated crop losses of about 73% uh, in the impacted surveyed areas. And we've also just completed last week a um, crop cutting uh, campaign there with, with the ministry and, and FAO as well. Um, this is an example in a response to a request from USAID to monitor water bodies across Somalia due to the devastating drought there. Um, as you all know, Somalia is facing catastrophic um, food insecurity. 
with a country devastated by extreme drought following five consecutive failed rainy, failed rainy seasons. Um, and like crops, livestock is very highly dependent on availability, the availability of water. And so here what I'm showing is an example of a water body near the Juba River that dried up um, by 2021 already. And we basically what we have then been doing is implementing this across the country so we can see the drying out of water bodies and when the last time there was pre water presence. And here I'm showing on the right side um, water bodies across the, the Juba River. Um, a different kind of example is uh, this was under COVID. It was uh, in an assessment in support of the government of Togo where they requested a rapid cropland map that they used and integrated with a variety of other data sources to ultimately help them allocate digital loans to farmers that were impacted by COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and then finally, I'd like to go into a bit more detail on uh, our ongoing work in, in Ukraine. Some of you might have heard this. I, I did give a, a World Bank uh, webinar a few months ago um, where I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail and, and talk a bit about how we've used these different kind of uh, source, different foundational data sets actually from satellite data to ultimately help assess production. Um, and the request was particularly to focus in the occupied areas where ground access data was, was not possible. And so shortly after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, we worked with the Ministry of Agriculture and we produced an in-season map of where winter crops were planted. Again, they were planted prior to the war versus where potential spring crops could be planted to initially assess how much of Ukraine's agricultural land was held by Russia. And we found that about 23% of the total croplands and around 29% of winter crops, um, largely those are as winter wheat, were under Russian occupation. Um, and because we didn't actually have any ground data at the time when we were doing this back in, in April of last year, we compared our initial planted area estimates of winter crops to the official statistics that were still available because these were produced prior to the start of the war. Um, and that helped to build our confidence in our assessments and to be able to monitor in particular what's happening in the occupied territories where data was no longer available. And that's a real strength and importance also of, of satellite data. And so we were then asked to help resolve two major uncertainties. Um, first was how much of the spring and summer crops could be planted, uh, given that there was a lot of speculation, including anywhere from 30 to 50 percent would not be planted due to the war. And so these are crops like sunflower and, and corn. Um, and secondly, how much of the winter crops would be left unharvested, even though they had been planted prior to the war? And again, uh, there were a lot of different numbers and, and estimates out there, anywhere between 30 and 50 percent. So we used a variety of different satellite data, including Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and Planet data, to monitor the planting progress of, of spring crops, and then later on to monitor harvest. Um, and actually what we found that the majority of the fields, including in the occupied territories, were actually being planted. And so this is an example just from Herson, but we did that across um, the entire country and ultimately found that only about 12 percent were left unplanted in occupied territories. We then were, ran an in-season field boundary delineation and used it to help clean up our crop type maps that we continued to run as the season was progressing and we could separate out more uh, crop types. And so we ultimately classified uh, winter cereals, winter rapeseed, which is an oil oilseed crop, sunflower, and other summer planted crops. Um, we use as a baseline the ESA World Cereals cropland extent um, for the previous year. And we ultimately found uh, that Russia was occupying a significant area of several of the major commodity crops, and we could give uh, estimates that weren't following administrative boundaries, which were some of the estimates that were initially out there and actually following the occupation lines and could also see how these were changing um, with the different uh, front lines, the front line was moving. And so using crop type maps as an input, we could then run several different yield models to ultimately be able to get at production. We did use the government's um, production estimates for the Ukrainian held territories, uh, but used our estimates from the occupied territories. And then, um, and then finally, we, ha we had the area planted, we had the yields, but now we had to get, of course, at what proportion would actually be harvested to ultimately get at, at, um, at production. And so here I'm just showing a time series of what was the signal we were looking for. And this is a, a wheat field in the occupied territories, and you can see it as it's greening up after winter dormancy. And that yellow, bright yellow signal, that's the harvest signal, okay? That's kind of what you're seeing here, the, the residue after it was harvested. 
And so we mapped that progress across um, as the summer was progressing. And again, ultimately found that the large majority of fields were indeed harvested. And the, the, the concentration of area on surprise that was not harvested was really concentrated along the front line. And so with that, we could ultimately make our production estimates. Um, and we could separate those out, importantly, by Russian-held territories versus Ukrainian-held territories. And we found that there were 5.8 million tons that were harvested in the occupied territories. That's about 22% of Ukraine's production. And this, of course, has major implications both for Ukraine and international markets. And I should say that these numbers were much higher than, than most of the estimates that were out there. Um, and maybe I'll just say a small note, and I'm happy to talk about it more. One thing that is important to emphasize, we can't just go from a map of counting pixels to an area estimate. Um, but again, I'm happy to talk about that, that later. So again, I think where did all that grain go is, um, was something that we weren't working on. There are a lot of other reports that did come out. Um, but we did get anecdotal evidence of what we were finding as well. Um, we also were working on, and this is work by Sergei and, and um, Stakun and, and Eric Duncan, on analyzing the damage to fields due to artillery craters. Um, and this is a heat map showing concentration of craters within agricultural fields, so combining that with our field boundaries to um, look at the, the concentration of, of artillery. This, is, of course, is indicative also of where there's a lot of unexploded ordnance. We mapped around 1.2 million craters just within agricultural fields. And this is then can be used to both help uh, put together policies to disincentivize farmers and to compensate farmers for lost agricultural land and to be, help inform demining efforts. So ultimately, these data were used by a variety of governments and organizations. Um, but what I'll say most importantly, they were used and are being used by the Ukrainian government to help inform their own market decisions and agricultural policies. And um, I'll leave this quote here from their first deputy minister. And I should also note that there are several different GLM partners that have been using satellite data to assess the impact of the war and really helping to demonstrate the value that this kind of data holds. Um, especially when ground ac access in this case and official statistics were not available, um, and when the requests are being guided directly and driven by the stakeholders. And that's really, really critical. And so in this context, we are proposing to establish a, a high impact and innovative policy-driven rapid response facility in the framework of the G20 AMIS and GeoGlam frameworks. Um, that would be really complementary to the rapid response forum because we're really seeing a gap in, in being able to provide timely and accurate uh, agricultural assessments that can help address critical information gaps, in particular in, in the face of increasing frequency and severity of extreme events due to a warming climate, due to conflict and war, market uncertainty, and other unforeseen events and disasters um, that ultimately can have real implications for uh, food security. So just to, to conclude, and very much echoing the, the opening remarks, um, global timely monitoring of agricultural production is more important and more pertinent than ever. Um, as we know that the factors that are influencing food insecurity um, in many cases can, can be unfortunately expected still to, to increase. Um, but And remote sensing really holds uh, tremendous potential, again, as was emphasized earlier. But in order to really realize that potential, we need to be able to still work on mitigating the disconnect between what we are and the state of the science and the research and mitigating that to the state of the practice. And a lot of that has to happen through really an emphasis on co-development and being led by our end users. We've got to be building the environment for sustained capacity, both on the skill side and on the compute side um, within the various national research and, and government institutions. Um, there's a lot more we could do in innovating between public and private partnerships, both across academia, government, and, and industry. Um, ground data remains a critical bottleneck for advancing remote sensing capabilities, um, and in particular focusing on smallholder systems on, and, and increasing both the accessibility of the data and analysis tool and advancing models um, for those systems that are so complex and, and challenging to monitor. And ultimately, again, also data sharing, model sharing, knowledge sharing, and also being very upfront about and communicating what the limitations and uncertainties are. So remote sensing is not going to solve everything. It will not replace ground data and ground uh, collection, but can really enhance and be uh, highly complementary. And with that, I'll stop and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Inba, and uh, for really kicking us off with uh, all the thinking behind uh, how this is done, very rich examples 
including the one in Ukraine. We earlier had a webinar on this and our uh, team in the region is very, very interested in. I don't know if, I can't hear you, Parmesh. I don't know if you, if you guys to still hear me. I need a technical support. Oh. Yeah, Yulia, you need to help. I hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah, Sorry. thanks. Okay, okay, thank you. I was worried for a bit. <laughs> I, I'm more worried about now the 97 people who are on the other side, which we can't see. <laughs> I'm more worried about them that they're not listening to us, but now I'm sure about that. So, Sharon, if you are on the other side, can you keep on checking this every 15 minutes and putting it in the chat that you are able to listen, you know, so that we are confident about that, you know. Uh, thanks a lot, Inba. Uh, much appreciate the, 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 the presentation. And, and uh, we really uh, uh, enjoy our current partnership with NASA Harvest on these issues, and we hope we are able to build something more structured on the lines you described in your last slide. And I think we need something more uh, sustained rather than sporadic on these things so that it gets integrated into the way we design policies, make investment decisions, and also the policy decisions there. Uh, next presenter uh, is again from an institutional perspective. I would like to invite uh, Rogerio Bonifacio, head of the Climate and Earth Observation Team at the UN World Food Program, who will talk about WFP's early warning systems. Uh, uh, Rogerio, over to you. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Miss the screen, can you see the full screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, and can you, can you hear me well? Okay, good. So this is a quick uh, presentation on the type of uh, applications we have uh, using Earth observation data uh, for uh, food security. Um, I think you mostly will be familiar with the work of the World Food Program. Uh, we present in about uh, 80 countries worldwide, one of the largest humanitarian agencies, at least in the provision of humanitarian assistance, and we currently um, probably provide assistance to about 100 million people around the world. Now, um, within this uh, large organization at headquarters, as a research assessment and monitoring division, which is responsible for many of the things, so the evidence generation uh, in terms of uh, food security, and one of the units, besides the markets and economics, the household assessments, the um, uh, anchor monitoring, is the climate and earth observation, which is the unit I lead. And this is a, a team of 20 scientists and analysts that uh, leverage satellite and climate data to inform uh, dual food program operations and programs. So our scope is kind of a internal, right? So we, um, we are an operational agency, and the work we do is to inform uh, specific operations and, uh, and programs. And there's a number of areas of work that, um, you know, I will select a few key ones uh, during this presentation, but it's a wide variety of uh, <clears throat> demands, and I would have to say a, a growing uh, demand for uh, climate and earth observation across the organization, uh, especially if I compare with the situation about uh, even five years ago, uh, the panorama today is uh, really quite different. And the, the initial uh, spur was pretty much on the monitoring uh, of growing season conditions around the world. So uh, recently, so we are implementing a, a cloud system uh, to deal mostly with the kind of a low resolution, longer record type of data that uh, you need to use for the monitoring of growing season conditions uh, across the world. Um, this is a growing system and we're now um, ingesting the Types of other types of data like seasonal forecasts, uh, reanalysis, not exactly Earth observation, but you know we have a kind of a holistic pr perspective, uh, and in terms of uh, any data set that can provide information on essential climate variables uh, on a grid format uh, <clears throat> or with the global uh, scope. And the objective of this system is to routinely provide a number of outputs uh, for analysis uh, to serve the business needs in Earth observation and climate data of the organization and uh, for, you know, potentially external customer, not there yet, but we're already, for instance, supplying uh, regular uh, climate information to OCHA uh, through their uh, humanitarian data exchange. So this aspect of sharing and having access to analysis-ready data will be uh, emphasized in the, uh, in the next year or so. So this is the kind of a infrastructure base and the seasonal monitoring. Uh, we, we don't have a, like a, a full-blown global platform 
uh, we more or less we have kind of routine um, products and indicators that we provide, and it's our regional bureaus that have taken charge of providing, based on this information, narrative reports to um, the country offices that they are responsible for, uh, but also for uh, you know circulating uh, within the regional institutions, um, country country level institutions, etc. And these are kind of familiar. Um, elements from those that, uh, you know, if you pay attention to early warning reports or if this is your kind of professional business, you'll be familiar with most of these type of uh, anti very anomalies, rainfall composites, SPIs, uh, extreme heat indicators, you know, there's a, a wide variety of elements that you can bring out and use them to uh, inform um, a perspective on current conditions in uh, growing season around the world. And of course, that's where this comes uh, from this effort, comes the contribution to uh, GeoGlam, um, where we, we have the, our presence through both my unit uh, at the headquarters level, but also some uh, select the uh, regional bureaus can bring a uh, more direct and um, kind of field-based perspective to the commentary and to the work of the, uh, um, the GeoGlam crop monitor for early warning. Uh, related aspect, it's uh, a kind of a what we call climate analysis, and essentially, uh, this is to use long-term records to understand past and present climate and its main tendencies. We focus on current trends, interannual variabilities, uh, characterization of recent climate patterns, identification, like in the case of uh, Madagascar, kind of a highlighting the fact that the country has is going through a prolonged dry period, and hence, uh, you know, the, the situation on the analysis that the country office does for the future and its planning can be informed by that. Um, and during so events, uh, you know, looking at historical data to provide detailed granular information on ex ante expectations of um, and so impacts, and you see kind of a typical patterns for early season rainfall in um, in Mozambique, so weather in the north, dry in the south, and you can... So, guardo subito ti mando una mail. I'm also looking at uh, rainfall trends and their corresponding influence on vegetation uh, patterns, so try to have a holistic picture as far as possible, uh, to then inform long-term program strategies and provide evidence to identify priority, priority areas of intervention and um, climate adaptation practices. Hazard mapping is uh, kind of a big thing. I mean, this has major impacts in some countries uh, on food security, and we've been paying particular attention to the multi-year flooding in South Sudan. This is an example of, you know, why should an agency like us have a specific unit dedicated to these things, besides the volume of work that is required. But um, we looked at uh, serious difficulties that uh, radar and optical data had in identifying the proper extent of flooding, and we had to develop a kind of bespoke um, analytical chain based on thermal infrared data to give the proper extent and dynamics um, of the flooding. And of course, this then is used directly by the country office because uh, a lot of this event has serious impacts on the availability of livelihood resources as, uh, you know, but detailed information on how it uh, spurred and uh, has driven uh, recently major inter-community fighting because of destruction of uh, winter pastures, for instance. Um, you know, whether you need to know much, you need to engage in kind of permanent resettlement of populations, etc. So it's a kind of a snapshot of how uh, some tailored uh, analysis are always required to provide the level of granularity, both spatial and kind of a, um, in terms of the characteristics that the country offices of the WFP need to um, provide the, the right kind of decisions for their planning. And um, not only at headquarters, uh, technical assistance to governments are a major uh, development for us uh, for the past two, three years, mainly around the, uh, you know, the flourishing work on anticipatory action. Um, part of it, which uh, we undertake in terms of assisting uh, meteorological agencies to become a quality provider of uh, agrometeorological information. And uh, this involves really, you know, um, longer term engagements and this is usually done through funding from the green climate fund or from the inspiratory action programs um, but through multi-year engagement with the um, meteorological services uh, we try to uh, increase the number of real-time available uh, stations to improve internal data flows 
uh, develop satellite station blended high accuracy agromet products, enhanced reporting capacity, and provide through the cloud uh, um, system I mentioned the access to analysis ready data on a variety of um, indicators. And we also pay attention to the climatological records. So both for Mozambique and Zimbabwe, these are the main uh, countries where this has taken place and we expect to uh, expand significantly in the next few years. Um, we engage in a major recovery of historical station data, mobilizing the data and applying the same methodologies of blending the satellite data in order to create long-term records, uh, gridded uh, data records of meteorological and agrometeorological data and indicators. And this comes also with enhancement of the reporting capacity, you know, kind of local bulletins, establishment of technical work, multi-sectoral technical working groups, and provisions of tools like a uh, prison platform that can bring together uh, climate risk information, vulnerability components, socioeconomic factors, etc. Cetera, et cetera. The other major area that uh, is kind of still a bit in flux, but I think we're working towards a, an, an operational service we can provide to country offices and governments if uh, required, <clears throat> is of course the uh, high resolution uh, crop type mapping and crop monitoring. Our interest in here is not really uh, agricultural statistics. The, the main driver for this is crop type mapping in conflict areas, and in particular to quantify losses in cropland, uh, quantify hopefully post-conflict regeneration, although in quite a few areas of the world, we would like to establish a first time cropland baseline, it could be South Sudan, Central African Republic, where this type of data is really um, hard to come by. Uh, technical assistance to governments, it's included, um, more on kind of a demonstration of what these new technologies can do. Um, but, you know, there's a boundary somewhere there where we don't really go into the uh, agricultural statistics business. And um, potential internal applications, they grayed out because they still maybe it's kind of getting the, the thinking ready uh, in terms of contribution of these analysis for smallholder support systems um, and uh, to other WFP project interventions like agricultural oriented resilience projects, um, index insurance, uh, and other types of activities that could benefit from this type of uh, information. Uh, there's a system uh, set up um, as we've got considerable experience now in field data collection there's uh, smartphone tools that collect the data we've worked with governments we adapt existing government forms um, training organization field campaigns and the data is mostly uh, uh, field perimeters uh, annotated with the characteristics of the crop that grow in that uh, field um, usually good results uh, very low um, um, kind of a training curve for the uh, for the tools that we use for the field data collection. Always the inevitable errors, but we, after a few campaigns, I think we averaging about 10 to 20 percent data loss after some rigorous quality assessment and control. <clears throat> In terms of the production of the maps, we do not develop our own systems. We've been relying on the systems developed by the. Uh, um, <clears throat> European Space Agency, first sent to Agri and first system. Now we're uh, uh, working with a beta version of the Stat that we're installing both in uh, AWS and uh, another uh, provider of cloud systems. And we should have. So this is kind of a transition we're in between systems and we hope to uh, have the full um, uh, setup in place uh, in uh, another few months. And this is the type of thing that uh, you, you can obtain. This was the first um, South Sudan crop type mapping uh, produced uh, back in 2018, but the pandemic kind of derailed a bit of our plans, now in transition systems, but we hope to, in cooperation with uh, FAO and uh, UNTP, to uh, see if we can have an operational system in place that could every year assess correctly the extent of cropland um, in the country, which is a, a major <coughs> piece of information that is currently, you know, still done through a crop and food security assessment mission, but I think it, um, this can bring in a lot more detail and a lot uh, a much richer data set uh, for the assessment of um, uh, food production in the country. We have usable results from this uh, first um, first experiment, and I would hope that uh, uh, we could bring, the, bring this to bear uh, from maybe potentially next year onwards. Uh, even in conflict areas, we do have a very 
large and significant logistical presence. Uh, in South Sudan, for instance, we have 13 sub-offices and that, uh, I won't say it's easy, but it's easier uh, maybe for us to carry out uh, large-scale um, data, uh, field data collection campaigns. And that was the case in uh, Northeast Nigeria um, for a first characterization of the cropland and crop type maps. Of course, um, much easier to do, much better quality on crop masks, cropland, no crop. Due to the known problems uh, that we know about, small field sizes, mixed agriculture, um, diffuse field boundaries, of course, the uh, results for crop type maps are of uh, lower uh, overall accuracy, of course. And this is the overview of the different pilots. Uh, quite a lot of the earlier ones were done on you know, really experimental uh, setups. We are really gaining the experience more on the field data collection, what works, what doesn't work. Um, but at the moment, we got you know, a significant amount of, uh, of data samples collected. We have now three ongoing projects, one in Lebanon, one in Iraq, and uh, an experiment that we hope still to get uh, off the ground in uh, in Somalia, uh, just for a district to uh, led mainly by the Ministry of Agriculture to see if uh, this is something that would um, be of use and uh, potentially become part of the um, assessments that uh, are carried out in country for assessment of food security conditions. And independently, the regional bureaus uh, do their own uh, analysis. This is an ongoing routine assessment of problem abandonment funded by the EU. And uh, this relies more on expert judgment over um, a spatial buffer around villages guided by uh, Sentinel-2 uh, timescan temporal color composites. So it's uh, laborious, but again, we hope to uh, leverage this type of analysis um, more and to kind of uh, transform it into a more efficient way. But it's uh, really the, the type of uh, analysis that we would like to decentralize and uh, take to other uh, areas uh, that are conflict affected. And some ways forward, uh, let's see now, of course, sampling is frequently constrained by logistics and security. So we're not free to go anywhere in these kind of uh, countries like South Sudan, Somalia, or um, uh, even Iraq and Lebanon. Um, the tools and the field data capture processes are well understood and they're working well. The challenges I mentioned them, uh, not much that we can do about them. We just have to enhance maybe the quality and quantity of the data that uh, uh, is now the, the constraint rather than the sophistication of the models. So some options for the future um, is to develop data-driven ways to improve uh, sampling this diverse reference state on the ground, uh, modern certainties from previous collections, um, so we could inform better where to um, uh, do future data collection, uh, try to reuse data from previous uh, uh, experiments or from um, uh, different um, or similar um, uh, areas with similar agroecological uh, patterns and crop types, um, weekly supervised techniques and areas we're going to explore, and even potentially alternative data collection modalities with drones uh, to enhance and maximize the available uh, data for training. So it's something, uh, an area that uh, on which we're uh, investing at the moment that there isn't a uh, operational system in place, but it's something that I think will uh, come up uh, in, the, in the near future. And it's obviously something that uh, we'll be learning to and hoping to leverage cooperation with uh, Harvest and other uh, you know, similar initiatives in the context of Geong Lab. So I'll uh, stop here and uh, there should be questions later on. Uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Rogerio. And WFP is really working in a number of these countries where we are working on food crisis preparedness plans and all, and I see a lot of uh, synergy in terms of how we can build on these systems. But again, the issue of having too many dispersed systems, not talking when critical decisions are getting made about policy or investments and all, then it becomes a little bit scattered, and it'll be good to listen to that. There are good technical questions already coming for both Inba and Rogerio. I would encourage everyone, uh, I will take questions from the audience also here. 
but on the on the online please keep on posing your questions in the chat so that we can harvest them at the end when we are doing a Q&A there so that we have a rich discussion at the end uh, the last presentation in this uh, session is uh, by Felix Rambor who is the team leader for food security joint research center of the European Commission and he will talk about EO based uh, information for food security policy and decision support. Uh, Felix, over to you. <laughs> Felix, can you hear us? Yeah. He needs to unmute himself. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Felix? Yeah, hello. I can hear you well. Just getting yeah. my presentation ready. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, it looks uh, well. It looks set up on my screen. Is it visible? Not yet. No, it's over there. Oh, it is there. It's there. Sorry, it sorry. Is. It's my fault. Yeah, because, because uh, I want to take yours. Uh, because I, I thought that we couldn't see anything on the smaller screens. So I thought let me put the big screen there so that we take advantage of the big screen. Uh, rather than showing the presenter there, we should show data on the big screen. So okay with everyone? Okay. Uh, okay. Over to you, Felix. Thank you very much, Parmesh. It's a pleasure to be there with you and with, with all the participants and to be part of this workshop organized by the World Bank. But it's also a pleasure to be in this session with uh, partners we know very well from the, the GeoGlam network, as has been mentioned, but also from uh, all the discussions and, and the dialogue which is taking place behind uh, the operational systems and the operational products at the level of research. So thank you very much also to um, WFP, to, to INPAO from, from NASA Harvest and to the CropWatch colleagues to, for sharing this, uh, this session with me. Um, the Joint Research Center is the organization we, uh, which is in charge of providing uh, scientific and te technical services to the European Commission. And we have been uh, uh, a fervid user of Earth observation since the early days of, of satellites, civil satellites in, in the 80s. And I would say that this experience in using Earth observation and in deriving uh, actionable information from the, from the data has become more relevant in the, in the current context. This context has been introduced very clearly by, by previous speakers, and so I, I think I don't need to say much on this. But just to uh, to link up with what was said in the in in the beginning, I mean, it's it's exactly the two points about uh, the needs of of distributing uh, more, but mainly distributing uh, producing differently in in a greener way and in a more sustainable way that makes the the, the evidence that Earth observation can contribute to policy and decision makers even more uh, relevant, and also the up the, the frequency with which this information is updated. So uh, looking very quickly at what are the main policy frameworks that can um, benefit from this kind of information, uh, I listed some examples there, and you can see that throughout, at, at all the scales from international to continental to regional, uh, all these policy frameworks benefit from uh, remote sensing based information. Uh, we have also seen very clearly before what kind of information is relevant, so I don't need to, to repeat that from crop type maps to land use maps uh, to yield forecasts, I would say what is really relevant is, is on one side baseline information and on the other side monitoring information to see how things change. Simple questions like where do crops grow, uh, how do they perform, how are they impacted by drought, those questions are, are still relevant and the change over time of those questions uh, is, is uh, relevant to inform uh, food systems transformation. So in the GRC, we, we have been using Earth observation, as I said, for quite some time for different applications um, in the, at the operational level, agricultural monitoring, uh, agricultural outlook, food security, early warning, disaster risk management, but also for compliance with regulation, the common agricultural policy of the European Union, for example, and new upcoming uh, regulation like the uh, deforestation free uh, commodity regulation um, that, that I'm going to talk about later on. So in this mix of operational systems, research and development and knowledge management, with this mix we try to inform the main policies of the European Commission in 
food security area, from development to humanitarian assistance to uh, producing uh, differently, producing in a greener way, and more and more uh, data and services coming from the European uh, Space Programme, from Copernicus, uh, feed or flow into this into this uh, system together with, with other data. Um, it is also very important to keep uh, very close links with research and, and development, uh, as I think also others have uh, have uh, said. There are some examples here about GRC products for agricultural monitoring and, and food security early warning. The most famous probably is the Mars bulletin in the middle that informs um, agriculture uh, agric about agricultural uh, production crop conditions in the European Union and provides yield forecasts during the season. And this is complemented by the ASAP system, the anomaly hotspots of uh, agricultural production at, outside Europe for countries uh, vulnerable to, to food insecurity. Together with these two operational systems, there is a continuous production of, of other products um, similar to examples we have seen by, by uh, Imbal and by, by Rogerio. Uh, like crop area uh, estimates, crop type maps for different countries, including many partners in Africa, but also uh, mapping related more to emergencies like uh, surface water or um, uh, change in of changes of water uh, reservoirs. Um, the coverage and, and the frequency with which we can produce this information has improved dramatically with the high resolution data that have become available over the last years and with new methodologies and uh, cloud computing and artificial intelligence. Because I think this workshop aims uh, particularly at fragile countries and vulnerable countries, let me say a few more words on the, on the anomaly hotspots of agricultural production uh, information systems, which is freely uh, available and produces, uh, transforms, let's say, um, Earth observation data and, and weather data into uh, information relevant for agricultural monitoring at different scales. It is made up of three information platforms. The most general entry platform, which is called the hotspot analysis, shows quickly where which countries are currently experiencing threats or problems to agricultural production during the ongoing season. The second environment is the warning explorer that zooms into sub-national level at the level of provinces and automatically shows those which are affected by agricultural drought. And then there is a, a, a viewer um, that allows anybody on the fly to zoom into the farm and field level and to quickly compare the latest uh, 10 meters resolution imagery with previous seasons so to see whether there are uh, negative anomalies or whether there are fields and farms which are underperforming. Information which is uh, coming out of this um, system flows directly into what Imba has shown, uh, crop monitor for early warning, so it's a GRC contribution to, to that system, but indirectly also informs food security assessments such as the integrated food security phase classification and ultimately through this food security um, analysis framework ends up in the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, reporting about uh, food insecurity. Uh, a typical workflow, not a necessary one, but a typical one is this. So basically going from the countries which every month are classified as, as anomaly hotspots uh, to zooming into the sub, at the sub-national level and seeing quickly which provinces are the most affected for either crops or rangeland, and then just to show visually, go down uh, to the field level and farm level and, and being able to detect which fields and, and which farms are, are underperforming. We're constantly working on improvements of this system. Um, this is a recent uh, improvement, which is related to seasonal weather forecasts. Uh, maps like the one you can see in the middle there for Africa are nothing new. This has been used for a long time, um, showing tersile maps, showing probabilities of uh, getting drier uh, in our weather or normal range for the next season. But we have added also the possibility to show whether for the drier probability we are in an extreme um, interval. And uh, next to it, on the left side, uh, we also introduce a new product or we're mapping a new product from Copernicus showing the skills of these maps. Because it's not only important to have a forecast, but also to, to, 
to at least have an indication whether that forecast is actually better than climatology or uh, or not. So this is the kind of improvement um, that which I think is really important for not only uh, aiming at more Earth observation uh, based products, but also higher quality and higher predictive capacity. Uh, in line with that, we're trying to use artificial intelligence and machine learning for improving yield forecasts um, at two uh, scales, at the subnational scale and at the national one. The subnational is based on data coming directly from countries at the, at the province level, and it's currently operational for two countries, Algeria and, and South Africa. And the national one is based on FASTAT data and is pre-operational for the 80 other uh, countries. The advantage of that compared with um, traditional approaches, statistical approaches, is mainly in, in the power of, of machine learning that allows to quickly automate uh, the processing um, very, very rapidly and to test uh, very high numbers of, of combinations of, of variables and their accumulation periods instead of testing uh, models uh, manually so that the, the, the say, capacity increases but also quality increases at the end by being able to identify the best models. Um, we are also, we started working on going beyond yield and looking directly at the at forecasting food insecurity uh, with artificial intelligence. Several of the partners present here in this workshop have been working on this in the past. World Bank, also uh, WFP, has worked on this a lot. So we, we start with a review um, and also looking at uh, whether it's possible to set up a hybrid model that selects the most relevant uh, variables. Many of these variables that have been used in the past are based on remote sensing. This is not doesn't necessarily mean that they are the most uh, relevant ones, but that it's also it has to do with the fact that remote sensing is uh, data are easily available and frequently updated. So we think that the review of all all, all this is needed and uh, an exploration on whether this can be improved. We also uh, started discussion with other teams uh, in the World Bank about longer term projections of food insecurity by using uh, climate uh, predictions. But this is at a really at a really early stage. Um, as part of the European Commission, we also continuously um, carry on research to inform new regulation. I mentioned the example of the European uh, new regulation on deforestation-free products. I don't want to talk about this a lot, but just to say, if you look at the, some of the data requirements for this new regulation, you can see that there is a strong spatial component there. So um, the typically data needed are farm polygons, uh, reference uh, maps for forest or land use change at cut-off dates, uh, thematic maps like protected areas. And this, in my view, shows very clearly that there is a strong potential for Earth observation to provide uh, relevant data that inform uh, this new policy and, and its implementation. And um, we have seen a number of examples of how we uh, use Earth observation data for operational systems and research. This is not only centrally at the EU level or at the Washington level, but it's also very important to, to share this and to increase capacity, not, not just awareness, but really capacity for countries and for teams in countries to, to do things on their own and to, to better use uh, available data. The GRC is partner in several projects with an important earth um, capacity building component. The ASAP system is a starting point for regional, regionally customized systems which are hosted uh, in the regions. There is one in East Africa and one in uh, North Africa, and we are um, investing in producing better reference data, such as, for example, um, prop type maps, similarly a bit to what Rogerio has shown, and also coordinating with Rogerio so that we don't uh, do the same things twice for the, for the same countries. Um, knowledge management, all this information that is produced, it is very important that it's not lost and doesn't stay on, on personal computers, but it is made available publicly and also shared uh, with, with uh, policymakers as we aim at informing policy. So the GRC in the last years has invested uh, significantly in knowledge management platforms. Here are three examples, one specific for food security, 
one for uh, Earth observation in particular, and one that shows uh, that collects uh, geospatial data for Africa in particular and uh, shows how they can be used. Um, coming to, to the end of this, I, I, I think the main uh, examples shown, but also the messages given echo very well what, what uh, the previous two speakers have, have concluded. Um, Earth observation provides independent evidence for informing uh, policies, but there is um, still a, a very strong need for ground truth, uh, data collection for calibration and validation. Um, Earth observation doesn't measure everything. It doesn't measure food security directly, so there is a need to uh, uh, go from from data to to information and the more we work together on this and the more we come up with multi stakeholder products uh, i think the, the better it is for the for the credibility and for the visibility of of this work um and finally the uh, high resolution and very high resolution is extremely important and we have seen many examples i think in this session about what is possible to do with this new data but also for monitoring at the national level and at the regional level, uh, the continuity and the quality of medium resolution data, resolution data remains important. So that's something uh, that should not be forgotten when, when we talk with uh, space agencies and, um, and also uh, funders of, of uh, new, uh, new sensors. Thank you very much. This is uh, all for my contribution. Uh, back, to, uh, back to you, Parmesh. Thanks a lot. Uh, much appreciated. This was I'm looking for a way to stop sharing. <laughs> Sorry. Time. So thanks a lot, Felix. I I mean, it. Very, very rich uh, contribution. And I think clearly a lot of work you have started taking from Europe to the international level is very relevant for what we are talking here today. Uh, there are a very interesting set of questions coming from online, but so I'll take a combination so that the people in the room don't feel <laughs> that we are ignoring them. They are come all the way from many parts to, to come here. So I'll take a combination questions, one from online, one from here, and then we can keep on going because we have still time up to coffee break where we can engage in this conversation. So uh, Inba, if you are with us, uh, the question is, uh, some, some questions are very direct. Uh, it's like, what is the accuracy of crop yield estimation? Uh, what's your confidence level on that? And the second question online is, uh, well, let me read then. And then let me take one question from the audience as well, so that we can take two questions in every round. Anyone, any question for Enba, please? Yeah, go ahead. Inba, I wanted to ask, um, you spoke about crop phenology, which I think is very interesting, um, and a lot of people are interested in this, but it seems like there really a lot of good crown truth data is, is lacking, really. So if you know any kind of good sources uh, that gives us like harvest event, planting events, and so on data, that would be that would be very interesting. I think here for everyone. Um, we, we would, uh, sorry. Would you like to would you like to go now for these questions so that you don't lose track and then we'll take another set of questions after that? Yes, yes, please. Great. Yes. Um, on the phenology data, if um, I would say if you know of good databases, we would be very interested. I think we're spending a lot of time on uh, trying to partner now with private sector organizations. So a lot of the ground data that does exist today exists in private sector, right? Whether that's advisory or whether that's actually the combines and the machinery um, or, or, or input or, or a whole host of organizations do actually have a lot of the data that would be really useful. And the question is, how do you make the case for um, data? So, you know, there's a lot of concerns that are obviously around privacy and, and security and IP of these kinds of data. And so the question is, how do we innovate around uh, forging mutually beneficial propositions to be able to unlock some of those data sets and at the same time be able to then advance and, and benefit everybody, um, but still being cognizant of what the limitations are for, for private sector to share those kinds of data. Um, so we've had some limited success, I would say, in, in, in doing that and are optimistic we can move forward and, and continue to do that. Um, I mean, there are different research stations in different organizations and countries that have cameras and phenocams that, that will take kind of um, pictures all the time and, and you can derive 
you know, those can be good, some good starting points of data sets. Um, but I'm not aware of a global network of, of those, although I'd be very happy. Um, and perhaps, I don't know if Felix or, or Rogerio um, are aware. So I know that's not a very helpful answer, but unfortunately that's the, the situation we're in. Um, and, and so maybe I'll, I'll throw that back to, to those on, on the line as well. And just to answer on, on the yield question, it of course depends on if we're talking about at the field scale, at the subnational scale, at the national scale. Um, similarly to uh, what Felix showed, we're running on our side about four or five different yield models um, that we intercompare and we try to assess where and when does each work best, under which crop combinations, under which growing conditions for, for which countries. Um, on If the question was specifically on Ukraine, again, um, over the, the long time, the uh, our ARIA model is anywhere from 4 to 10 percent um, accurate. I showed, I think, a slide on a newer model we're working on, on Versi, which we're working on testing at the field scale and aggregating from the field scale up to the subnational scale. And there, depending on the all blast we were looking at, it was 90 to 95 percent. But again, it, it varies across the country and we haven't run it yet on, on all um, all blasts there. So I hope that answers your questions. Thanks a lot. And can, we can take, uh, if there are more questions in back, can you please introduce yourself uh, while you are talking? Because it will also allow us to know who is here, uh, go with you and then with you as well. Okay. Is, there, is there another hand? I've seen two. Okay, three. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Ian Schuler. I'm with Development Seed. So my question is sort of for all the panelists. You noted that uh, ground data is the big uh, barrier to increasing quality of uh, uh, models at the moment. I mean, how optimistic are you that new approaches to modeling, particularly AI modeling, that have developed for the last six months, or not, not have been really gotten into production really over the last several months, foundational models, transformer-based models, Semi, more super, semi-supervised approaches. How confident, how, how, I guess, optimistic are you that that will lead to uh, qualities in model prediction, even with current levels of ground data? But let me take the other one, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Isha Sala. I'm a research faculty from University of Maryland. Um, and so my question is about, so um, most of our uh, keynote speakers talked about uh, the importance of um, ground data, and I think it's kind of related to the question um, he posed now. Um, and so most of the modeling or crop, crop maps that we are able to see today uh, engage both remote sensing data and ground data, and most of the machine learning models um, that used to forecast or do classification maps also use these both kind of data, which is great. But I was wondering what, how we were able, we should be able to determine um, the ratio of the ground tr ground truth data that should be used along with the remote sensing data when we are training models because. Uh, ground truth data can be more error prone because of a lot of agents that um, or enumerators that collect this data and also how you, we how um, you're able to find confidence in the data that you find from private sectors um, and and a follow-up question with that I'm sorry that this is very long but I'm just trying to make sure that uh, that I'm making sense uh, is also uh, once you have predictions from your models or the maps, um, is there a way that you're able to tell which data or which features of your data is contributing to these um, these insights or these model predictions and uh, how far they are accurate? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the two, three questions embedded in your one question right now. So I'm sure, I hope the <clears throat> presenters have taken note of your various questions. I mean, the last so interestingly, mine is also about ground truth. Uh, so all the speakers talked about the need for better ground truth data, data collections, and coordination of those so we can have better confidence in these maps. Uh, and we all know, I think all the speakers, I know them, we have talked one-on-one -on -one and all the people in this room, and there is a lot of data already being collected by different agencies, putting aside the private sector, just the publicly funded data sets. And there's always issues in accessing and sharing those. Uh, and the issue is not infrastructure, it's always mechanisms, processes, incentives in sharing those data so everybody can build a trust in those. Uh, what do speakers and panelists think about 
how we can resolve that. It is a community issue. It's not a technology issue. Uh, and if anybody has any thoughts where we can go from where we're sitting today, even opening up the data we have now, because some of them, I think uh, Flix mentioned that this, some of them is about data privacy. I mean, governments s sponsor a data collection and they have data sovereignty rules. They don't let you share. But at the same time, they need an insight that that data can basically open. So any thoughts, any feedback on that would be helpful. Yeah. Very rich set of questions. I, the floodgates are open when we get everyone to here to talk, and uh, that's the purpose. And so uh, this question is not to one presenter, but to all. So I will this time start with the, the last presenter, and the Felix. Felix, can you respond to the set of questions which were raised in this round? And then I'll come to Rogerio, and then I'll come to Inba in the end. And then I'll take some questions from the online audience so that they don't feel left out again. Yeah. Yeah, but just to be sure we mean the same question. Was it a question about um, how much ground data is actually needed to improve models? I think that's one question and then other questions are related to each other. So why don't you start with that and maybe others will pick up on other questions. Yeah. You know, I'm, I find these questions very interesting because these are typically the, the, the questions we are facing every day when working with Earth observation and, and also when when I think some behind uh, these messages or, or these um, the, <laughs> say the, the messages in the presentations about the, the need for for more more ground data. I think what what we are seeing very often is that uh, uh, collection of, of ground data is expensive. I mean, let, let's face it. And uh, which leads to the fact that in applying Earth observation data for producing information like the one we have seen, uh, this tends to be a bit uh, neglected because it is much easier to start working on, on Earth observation data and try to, to produce outputs uh, rather than organize uh, um, uh, field data collection campaigns. So th this is the, the reality we are we are assisting to, and and it is it is there are challenges in in collecting ground data that some some uh, people here have mentioned, trusting um, uh, private or or knowing whether there is the right capacity to carry this out. So to answer very quickly to the question, I mean there there is no perfect answer. It depends very much on on uh, on case by case how much what is the minimum of of data uh, of data needed. Um, my own experience is that um, if we look at, at resources available for a project um, and we compare the costs of, of Earth observation data and processing those data and the cost of the, of the ground truth data, um, I, I've seen that very often if things uh, <laughs> need to be done, should be done properly, they are kind of half-half. Of, of and this is a bit... Uh, and an orientation we, we followed, for example, recently in the crop type mapping uh, that has been shown in several countries in, in East Africa, half of the resources of the project for producing a crop type map uh, and crop area estimates for large area, large fractions of a country, half of the, the resources needed go into, um, into ground truth data collection. Of course, there are, um, there are sampling approaches and, and uh, for, which are ideal for each uh, thematic map that needs to be produced. So this cannot really be generalized. But uh, it also has to do with the fragmentation and the complexity of the landscape. So Ukraine is, is one of the ideal uh, countries in this world for remote sensors because of the large fields and the uh, relatively limited variability of crops on those fields and, and crops are, are, are not limited into cropping. So this is a, a, a situation that the in, needs less uh, lower density of sampling and, and lower uh, less complex stratification than, than uh, an African landscape or but is, these are very general um, I think it's very general thinking just to give an idea of the complexity when we come to uh, decisions about collecting uh, ground data. There's another question about sharing. I think the for sharing also, it is important that institutions who own data see the advantage of sharing. So this has to do uh, with collaboration, with, with uh, um, stimulating and favoring uh, an open approach to data and working together in networks such as GeoGlam, but not only. Um, I've always seen that um, uh, institutions in, in 
poor countries, for example, they are not per se against data sharing, but of course, it has to do also with, with resources available to institutions and with institutional development. But um, generally, uh, the more we are on our, from our side, able to, to uh, collaborate and to, to strengthen capacity, the easier also data sharing uh, becomes. Um, back to you. Thanks a lot. So before I go to Rogerio, there is one specific question to you, Felix. Uh, it says that common agriculture policy leads to good availability of ground truth data for agriculture in Europe, which is lacking in other regions. Can CAP data be used for training EOL algorithms for other regions? Or how can this gap be effectively addressed in development applications? Thank you. It, it, I think this is a question we would need to explore uh, specifically whether uh, there can be kind of transfer um, in, in the modeling, transferring a model from one region where it has been trained on to another one. So we would really need to look at, at, uh, at the specific case. Um, you know also, I think Oh, so yeah, okay, I think you are very familiar with how the, the, the cup works and you know where the data come from. So the data are, many of the data are entered by farmers. Um, this is a special, a specific model. So I think it's very important to answer your question, to, to look at what is exactly needed in a specific case and to see how um, lessons learned and, and mechanisms developed for the cup can be uh, applied in, in other situations. Thanks a lot. I uh, appreciate your response. Uh, Rogerio, coming to you, uh, there's one specific question for you okay. on uh, uh, humanitarian data cube that if you had a wish list, mm. who else would you want contributing data so you have the training data you need? And then uh, the other questions are general questions which were talked about ground data and all since WIP has presence in almost mm. all the local locations compared to other agencies here. Uh, how do you see uh, how much of ground data and how much of earth observation data you need as a mix to uh, evolve a more kind of a um, rigorous as well as a more usable model? Over to you, Rosario. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> well, on the the cube for the moment, uh, it's more dedicated to the lower resolution data. So the, the kind of um, uh, the crop type mapping efforts are done within in other uh, with other infrastructure options, um, but uh, so for the moment that is uh, more for the uh, lower resolution climate long term data. Um, but you know, um, eventually the, some of the results uh, end results of the crop type mapping will make their way there. Um, and obviously, you know, we can look into uh, it, it's open in terms of the data that we can provide out of there. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely we could, uh, um, who else, whoever has uh, data sets to offer to us, uh, we'd be glad to, uh, to, to have them as well. Um, but it's something that we can, you know, with Gaurav, uh, engage in a in more detailed discussion uh, and see where we could take this. And um, on the issue of the ground data on the, on the sharing, for instance, I mean, we shared some of our data um, uh, already with, uh, for instance, the World Serial uh, Initiative. Um, and we'd like to share in the scope of some kind of a you know joint type of work, or you know especially in the context where we could benefit from some know-how and uh, you know and the development of methodologies. I hope this doesn't sound too transactional, no. But <laughs> um, but it's uh, you know it's it's something that we'd like to also use that to evolve our own uh, capacities, right? So if there's a you know some kind of a, a an agreement to uh, develop some methodology to explore some particular and specific aspects. Um, then, of course, the you know the, the data is open for sharing. Maybe not all of it, because if we work with some governments, then we are bound by, and the data is collected by the government agency. Then they they bound by their uh, their own agreements. But you know, it's something that we're open to um, <clears throat> to talk about and uh, and see if uh, you know there's um, um, mutual benefits that. Uh, could could be brought to bear. So, um, in terms of the data, how much data is needed? Um, it's uh, well, it's tricky. For instance, we our volumes of data they may look you know okay, twenty thousand samples in all. In some countries, we have like five thousand samples. Uh, but a lot of this has been so. We're now recognizing that um, 
uh, this has been so constrained by security logistics that the data ends up having a fair degree of clustering. So the, the, uh, the maybe the effective number of samples is much, uh, much lower. We had some success in South Sudan with um, this particular circumstance, although it happens in quite a few countries, uh, where there are significantly large household surveys. And those are subject to kind of a more structured uh, sampling uh, procedures. And uh, with South Sudan, one of the data sets was captured by kind of introducing an additional enumerator uh, with the uh, um, household enumerators, <coughs> whose task was to collect data around in the villages. And that, you know, uh, we probably, probably one of the reasons why we got fairly good results for South Sudan. Uh, in spite of uh, not having that much uh, data volumes in terms of, especially if you consider the size of the country. Um, but we don't have a, you know, uh, a clear a clear picture in there. We quite limited in terms of the, um, there's more kind of research aspects that, uh, you know, some, some of the research questions do need to be answered, but we need to find the proper way to do it because we are limited. We are an operational agency. We have pressing operational requirements um, you know, on a constant basis, and uh, the time to you know, elaborate on this um, on this research aspect is quite limited. So, hence, partnerships with academia or private sector, for instance, would be welcome in so that we could uh, start putting a bit more, um, you know, shaping some of the answers to to these important questions. There was an initial question on how confident we what we are in um, kind of a more uh, frontier uh, methodological approaches. Um, we don't know, uh, but we are confident enough to have them in a, you know, kind of a potential work plans. And uh, it's definitely something our lead data scientist uh, is very keen to explore. And it's definitely on our, you know, let's try and do this. Uh, options. We, have, have, we are contacting researchers, um, uh, not just in the area of crop type mapping, also in some recent uh, um, <clears throat> uh, some recent uh, initiatives in terms of uh, um, weather forecasts and you know been doing the literature review uh, but uh, for the moment um, yeah um, you know it's um, I think we want to try that um, but uh, but let's see uh, uh, the specific the specificities of how we do that uh, remain to be seen but it's definitely something that we'd like to, to explore um not sure if there's a additional question there was a last one I think think that I might have forgotten. No? You covered most of the ones, so I very really appreciate you keeping track of okay. all the questions coming in. And I think I think if there are other questions, they may come in the chat to you. And I would encourage yeah. you to look okay. at those and respond in the chat as well, because there is some bilateral conversation, multilateral conversation we require in the virtual discussion box as well. Uh, so, uh, Inba, coming to you in the end, to all those generic questions about sharing, about uh, ground data versus the, the, the EO data, and then uh, what do you see in future, uh, the confidence uh, with which we are going to do the crop estimates and other kinds of things. Uh, can you have your composite view on all these questions so that we can close sure. the session properly? Yeah. yeah, thanks. I think those are all really good um, questions and, and also a lot of good discussion already. Um, going back to the first question from development speed, I think I am optimistic and I think there's several folks there from, from NASA Harvins in the room that are directly working on some of our machine learning um, pipelines on, for example, the, the mammal model from Hannah Kerner and, and Gabriel Tang, which they're really trying to look at how do you leverage large and diverse global data sets that are available to generally learn about what croplands look like so then you can specialize those models with much smaller local data sets. That doesn't solve the problem, right? But it's, I think there are a lot of promising advances in the machine learning space about how do we leverage the data sets that are there. Um, I think on the ground data collection side, there are also different exciting developments, whether it's kind of I think IASA is working on looking at street view images and automatically classifying those and you know, trying to derive more training data. Again, on our side, Catherine that Columba has a project on you know, putting cameras on, on helmets and being able to collect a lot of data that way and then automatically classify those. So I think there's a lot of innovation um, in terms of how do we start to break the back of this um, 
uh, ground data lack. But of course, there needs to be a lot more investment, a lot more targeted investment on how do we, I think going back, Isha, to, to, to your question, and of course, you know this very well, you're, you're working on these too, is how do you make sure that we have you know, ultimately, what we need is a representation of what we're trying to to map or classify, right? So you want to get the diversity. So it's very hard to answer that question because what your training data needs to do is represent the diversity of what your target crop or classification looks like. And so as Rogerio is saying, if you've got, you know, 5,000 fields, but they're all in the same kind of clustered and are very similar, that's not adding a lot of value. Um, and the other thing is, is, of course, we need to have also be the, the data that we're going to confuse what we're trying to map with. So oftentimes we struggle with fallow class, right? Like we don't have enough of, of that training data and that can often look very similar to an actual cropland. And so making sure that we also have the, uh, a representation of what we're going to confuse our class with in the training data becomes very important. Um, I think the question, uh, Hamid, you know, obviously we've had a lot of discussion around this. How do you incentivize? There is, you're right, a lot of public data already out there. I think there are different initiatives that you're engaged with. GeoVlam is trying to have its own kind of, um, that, that you're engaged in that discussion, of course, on how do you start to coordinate all these different in-situ data sets that are out there? How do we make sure when a project is over that that data continues to live on? How do we have the standards for that? Um, so I think there is a lot of progress. I think some kind of promising discussions on, in terms of how do you incentivize it, I think if you think about a lot of, of private sector have a need for this kind of data. And because it's not, there is no public good in most places in, in the world, they're each developing their own. Right? And so you, you can have a, a situation where you have five or six different companies developing the same map for the same location, collecting their own training data, some questionable what the validation and, and what uh, the uncertainty is around those. And I think thinking about systems where perhaps you can on, on secure computing share that data, right? So you're not actually sharing your actual data, but that data is being used to train and benchmark and validate models in a secure system so that ultimately everybody, everybody benefits from the output of that system. And then you kind of build your competitive products on top of that. And I think there's, um, there's some kind of early discussions and looking into how might one put those kinds of things together. But I think there's a lot of innovation and things that can happen in terms of how do we um, move forward and, and look at innovative ways of, of breaking the back of, of, of this question. And I, I'm sure I've missed other questions, but um, th those are the notes that I, that I have. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Inba. So I think uh, this has been a fantastic kickoff of this session. I think uh, I want to make sure you get your coffee and get re-energized before the next uh, big motivation we're going to get from the next set of presenters. So I just don't want to summarize, but I want to say that clearly the issues relate with, uh, we, we get a full sense of what's happening in the field. We clear that a lot is happening. There are many use cases being developed. Uh, but our interest is now that when key policies get made, key investment decisions get made, all this data comes together to inform that. And when we make these decisions, like uh, we have, we are going to invest in food crisis preparedness plan in almost 29 countries going forward. Uh, we would like to make sure that all the collective experience of what these institutions have already done uh, is done. And plus, we lay down the foundation for a medium term or a long term data platform, which really is able to be utilized this as you go forward. Uh, it's not an easy one. I think every institution has its own mandate and strength as, as uh, I think uh, 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 clearly, you know, when WFP Rogerio is also investing with each crisis and they have to do things in fast mode and uh, they, they can contribute to an overall platform, but they have to, same with the World Bank also. We have to keep on making investments in those places. But I think there is a need to have a platform, which in some senses GeoGlam has played that role along with other partners to really get that uh, going and, and as, as Hanad is saying that the sharing part has to become a little bit more structured and systematic so that uh, we have almost most of the information uh, data is available but it's not analytics is not available uh, so in the data value chain we see a lot of data being available but not the analytics and it's very difficult to uh, have a community which does both access uh, analytics and design and then also, in, in, so we would like in every project we design to be accompanied by an earth observations uh, specialist 
or an institution. And that would be our kind of vision or a dream in that sense, because then we'll make sure that we are designing investments, policies are in a very appropriate manner there, I'd say. So it will be like WFP, World Bank, the key institutions should become the users of this information on a regular basis. And if we can build that protocol here uh, to do that, that is kind of our, uh, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight. That's why this is the first uh, kind of investment in that direction. And I hope we are able to come with a kind of a platform as we go forward there. So I would uh, now, let's break for 15 minutes for coffee. And uh, it's actually you want to say something? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 okay. Oh, 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 she is more liberal than me. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I think, when are we coming back? What's the time? So we're coming back at 11.15. So 11.15. Uh, please feel this time to network with each other. Uh, we would like to also like to know you a little bit better. And, uh, and uh, I'm very thankful to all the three uh, presenters, uh, Enba, Rogerio, and uh, uh, Felix for really uh, enriching this uh, and kicking us off extremely well. And thanks to all of you for participating actively. Thank you. No, certainly that must be a nice smart What is the password for uh, for Wi-Fi? Oh, it's in the corner there. Yeah, yeah okay. over there. See guest like uh, 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 near the white pillar.
Lama ni tak ada masuk. Jadi dia tak sempat pulang. Lama. Lama. Belamar. Well, I think we're ready to start our next session. 
Once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, in this session, uh, we will have uh, a little bit of homecoming. We'll look into what the World Bank does with deploying Earth observation data for food security monitoring and helping cli our clients to do so. Uh, we will also have two presentations from the field, from China and Kenya. Uh, the speakers would reflect on how the countries use remote sensing data, uh, once again for food security monitoring and broader ag food transformation. Um, Hongwei, sorry, would you mind joining us here? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be best. So I am joined here by the esteemed panel, um, as, and I'll introduce them as they are before the presentations. Um, uh, three of the panelists were uh, able to join us here in-house, and then one of them unfortunately could not get visa on time, so he will join us um, remotely. Uh, before I make the introductions, very quick housekeeping. So um, we kindly ask that you keep your remarks 15 minutes long. Um, I have uh, little timekeepers here if we need those. After this session, we'll have a little bit shorter Q&A session, just 15 minutes. So we'll try to stay on time during the actual session so that we still have um, enough room for, uh, for discussion and questions. Uh, with regards to questions, I would like to ask the online participants to please share your um, questions in the chat. We'll be harvesting those. Um, and without further ado, our first presenter is Alex Chune. He is the European Space Agency representative to the World Bank, and he supports coordination of collaborative activities under the European Space Agency Partnership and the Joint Space for International Development Assistance Initiative across the World Bank. Uh, he previously worked at the World Bank as a geospatial data scientist and contributed uh, to the deployment of Earth observation techniques and their applications to the World Bank operations and advisory services, so knows firsthand the needs of, of our clients. So, um, Alex, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm, thanks. Thanks a lot, Katerina. And happy to be here today uh, with all of you. So my presentation, as it was mentioned by Katerina, will not really focus on state-of-the-art innovation, but more on a programmatic approach on, on how really can we think about the adoption and sustainable integration of those tools uh, at the World Bank and, and the sustainable adoption of those tools and those technologies in uh, beneficiary countries, in the client state stakeholders of the World Bank. So to, just to start, I want to, to show you a quick framework that we often use at the European Space Agency and that's been guiding us, uh, which are the five A's, availability, accessibility, awareness, acceptance, and adoption. So I, th I think that's, uh, and I, I'll, I'll try to be quick on this and, and to, to really uh, focus on, on really uh, the, the programmatic approach I was mentioning before, but just to give a bit of context, I think that all of us know that uh, there's been a huge uh, leap forward in terms of availability and accessibility of Earth observation data, thanks to programs such as Copernicus, but many other uh, public and, and commercial private providers. There is a lot of Earth observation data that is available out there through the Copernicus program alone. There is around 250 terabytes that are being disseminated daily. And therefore, th th there's been uh, and there is an increasing volume of data that is being made available. However, we are, we are understanding and we understood in the last few years that this is not enough to achieve adoption, that, that we need to move forward and, and collaborate and partner with different entities and, 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 and companies and institutions to really go further in raising awareness, acceptance, and achieving adoption of those tools, right? And that's what the European Space Agency, together with the World Bank, through their partnership, have been trying to do uh, in order to mainstream the use of those tools within uh, development finance. So one quick example still that I want to give on, on kind of the, the supply side of, um, of EO data, and that's because it, it just <clears throat> actually literally uh, was published a few weeks ago, um, is the World Serial Database. So that's a project through which uh, crop mapping at, at field scale is, is disseminated globally and is updated seasonally. So literally, those are crop maps for the whole world at the scale of 10 meters that are produced for the whole world and that are going to be uh, updated seasonally. So this 
is literally what we're talking about in terms of not making only the imagery available, but making value-added products available and easy to access. Uh, this is actually just uh, from yesterday available on the OpenEO platform, but you can also contact me if you would like to get access to FTP. And my uh, colleague Zoltan Zantoy has been working uh, very hard on this to achieve this. The, really the objective is to make this data available to all the different institutions and beneficiary countries that, took, that could take care advantage of it. So just wanted to mention this because this is a, a great database that we'll be able to build on right now and in the next few years. Now coming back on, on more the angle of awareness, acceptance and, and adoption, um, the European Space Agency, as I was mentioning, has been collaborating with different international financial institutions, including the World Bank, for more than uh, 15 years. And this collaboration has gone through several phases. First, uh, there was the EO World phase, which was really about small demonstrations uh, to raise awareness. Then there was EO 4SD, which was really about consolidating requirements and, and, and strategic um, engagement uh, of, of development stakeholders to build capacity on Earth observation services. And we're now in the third phase, which is the GDA phase, the Global Development Assistance phase, through which we aim really at mainstreaming the use of those tools within operational processes and financing. So in order to talk and really to focus on, on the topic of food security, I would like first to talk about the second phase because this has already happened and we can therefore kind of draw lessons from, from this phase, which is the EO4SD phase. So EO4SD had actually an agriculture and rural uh, development component. And the objective was really to achieve progressive uptake of, of satellite-based environmental information through uh, support that was delivered to World Bank teams and World Bank projects uh, with companies that were actually mobilized by the European Space Agency to develop a, a service or a product, a fit-for-purpose service for those projects, right? So that was really the idea behind this program. And as I was mentioning, uh, especially for the activity dedicated to agriculture and, and rural development. As part of the EO4SD, uh, only agriculture and rural development, because the EO4SD covered other different sectors, we engage with around uh, 60 stakeholders, different capacity building events were organized uh, that translated in, in many different events being, uh, being held, publications, and also a lot of data being disseminated. But I think that what's really important here is that through this program, we uh, supported different teams and projects on the side of IFIs, uh, like the World Bank. And this is by learning on how this went and, and where we could get plugged in in the project cycle that we'll only be able to better understand how this can get adopted and mainstreamed. The projects were in, uh, across the globe in many different countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, Asia and, and, and East Africa, more specifically, and, and the different sectors that we targeted through this activity were the following. So you see that the second one is food security and agriculture risk management, but as a matter of fact, you can also imagine that irrigation or agriculture and ecosystem services relate to the question of food security. So there were quite a few projects that we supported directly uh, on, on the topic of food security. And before I give a few examples, I think it's, it's important here as we think about the programmatic approach to think where this gets plugged in in the operation of the World Bank. Um, and then what we need to think about is the project cycle at the World Bank, right? So the project cycle at the World Bank looks like this. And EO services and EO data technologies can get plugged in at different steps of this project cycle. They can, it can get plugged in in the identification and preparation. We will use this data, the services, to better understand um, the context, to do geographical targeting, to, to really better design the investment or the operation itself. Or it can also be plugged in in the implementation phase and the evaluation by monitoring different variables um, in, those, in the countries of intervention in order to understand how is the operation and the investment going, what's the impact, and also uh, exposed, better understand what was the global impact and general impact of the intervention, right? So those are, I would say, uh, what we need to take into account, and, and those are the steps where we plugged in those, uh, where we have tried to plug in the services. There is also another layer, actually, at the World Bank, which are the advisory services, of course, um, and those different pieces like uh, AS, ASAs, which are 
uh, reports produced by the World Bank often um, that we've tried also to support because they help to frame the strategy in some countries. And I will also give a quick example about this. So first of all, um, I would like, I was, I was, as I was mentioning, to, to give you three, four examples that will illustrate on uh, some of those steps how we've thought about uh, integrating those technologies and, and, and the use of Earth observation to inform uh, food security related operations and projects. The first one would be the Sahel Irrigation Initiative uh, Support Project. So this project was really about uh, trying to improve investment and man management capacity when it comes to uh, irrigation services and really to it itself increase the, the extent of irrigated areas uh, in the region. The idea was to use Earth observation to uh, produce dynamic crop products to gain insights into recent and current irrigated, irrigated areas. And therefore, the outcome was first to produce a baseline to understand, OK, in this country, where are the irrigated areas? What has been the dynamic over the last few years? And therefore, to kind of scale and target the project. So that's literally what I was mentioning before around preparation and identification. However, what was produced was also used to monitor uh, the evolution of irrigated areas across the years and to potentially understand what is the impact of the project. So that would be a first quick example. Another example is the GEF, which is the Global Environment Facility Integrated Approach Pilot on, uh, and, and, and the program on sustainability and resilience for food security. So here, I would say it was a more cross-cutting need that we've tried to address because the, this program as it in itself targets agroecological systems in, in 12 African countries in the dry light regions. So it's a much larger extent. And the idea here was more on the MNE aspects. How can we use different types of indicators that are related to um, crop extents, crop yields, irrigation, uh, productivity, to really inform the program and, and kind of feedback in the design of the program for uh, the next phases and, and, and the next investment that were to be made in the program. To, to give you a few examples of the products, of course, that includes products like land cover, uh, vegetation dynamics, so basically the evolution of the vegetation across a few years, um, and also crop water productivity for irrigation monitoring. So that relates somehow to what I was mentioning before. So those two first programs that I've mentioned to you would fall more into the, okay, how we use our observation to better prepare uh, an operation or to better monitor its impact. A third example, which is slightly atypical, but I think that relates very well to, to food security, is uh, the case of Syria and how in Syria we've used basically Earth observation to once again monitor cultivated lands and understand what was the dynamic and, and what was the impact of, on, of the conflict on, agriculture, on the agriculture sector in the country, right? So this was an analytics, uh, analytical piece, right? So one of those advisory pieces I was mentioning to you before. Therefore, here it's more <clears throat> about potentially preparing a pipeline of investments, right? And how we can use uh, the Earth observation tools and services in this context. So this is often something that needs to be done, uh, I would say, at a larger scale and, and maybe a more coarse level. And that's what we need to take into account here. And I guess a message I wanted to convey, which is that the most accurate and precise and, and kind of state-of-the-art technology is not necessarily the best fit for every operation or type of activities at the bank because you really need to think about, okay, what's the end goal and is there a way really to mainstream the use of those technologies? Typically, an analytics piece like this doesn't have a budget of one million. So you need to think about, okay, what is the in-between that like technology that we can use that's relatively affordable and that will still bring us meaningful um, information on, on, what we, on, on what is the impact of the conflict and really how we can inform the pipeline of activities that is coming up. And then the fourth um, example, which I think is also very interesting and there is, I, I take a quite a different angle, which is the next generation drought index. So I was mentioning how we can use those technologies to better prepare, to better identify uh, projects, geographical targeting, how we can use them to monitor and evaluate. But here, the next generation, next generation drought index is about how do we actually integrate Earth observation within 
the insurance mechanism itself, right? So it's really about integrating Earth observation within the operation itself and not as an added layer that will provide an additional layer of information. So the next generation drought index is, is a practical framework to, to help better monitor and anticipate and trigger uh, financial response to, to severe uh, drought events. And the idea here was to create an index that combines state-of-the-art Earth observation, such as precipitation, soil moisture, and vegetation greenness, greenness and other types of advanced uh, analytics linked to risks modeling and novel methods to, uh, to, to close critical socioeconomic data gaps. So, the approach here, as I was mentioning, was really to use our observation as an input to create an index that then was going to inform the insurance uh, scheme itself. And, and this is still being rolled out because this is something that has to be developed very closely with the client, with the beneficiary country that takes a lot of iteration. Uh, it's much more demanding. But I think that's what we want to move towards, right? That we really want to push a more comprehensive integration of those technologies within the finance schemes themselves, within the insurance schemes themselves, instead of having this just as an additional layer, which is also very important, right? Um, one thing that I wanted to, one minute, okay. One thing that I wanted to quickly add uh, is the importance of, of capacity building, of course, and that comes back to what I was just mentioning before. Um, and I had a few slides on the GDA, but I'll try to be quick and, and stop on this slide to give you a bit more information in the sense that in the next phase, which is the global development assistance phase that I was mentioning before, what we're really trying to do is not to think anymore in just a top-down um, approach where we arrive, we provide those tools, we provide this data, and we basically tell the TTLs or the project leaders or project managers, look, you can use this data now, uh, kind of build on it to better frame your intervention. The reality is that now we're really trying to move towards something that is co-owned, co-created with the local stakeholders, with the beneficiary countries, because that's the only way that we, really, we will really achieve the mainstreaming of those tools within the financing itself. And we're working hard on this uh, together with the team that is the digital risk partnership team, but that's something that we should have in mind and that we should try to integrate in every GP at the World Bank, in potentially every trust fund at the World Bank, which is not to think about this as something top-down, but also involve from the beginning the beneficiary countries and the use of those tools, try to match the, 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 de the development of those tools with capacity building and skills transfer in order really to have a feedback loop where the development of those tools is together with the beneficiary country and where we really achieve the mainstreaming of those tools for the inf to inform the, the investment themselves and uh, for the tools to be mainstream within the beneficiary country institutions. So I think I'll, I'll stop here, right? Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I think this was a wonderful example of how we can narrow that gap between the um, state of science and state of practice in the context of the World Bank um, operations. And I think that uh, this last slide on building capacity and ownership of the client countries in using this data and technologies and analytics um, is very important. And I would actually like for us for this to be a common theme throughout this workshop to see how can we ensure that that capacity is built um, on the ground because this would ensure the sustainability of these solutions. So um, now let me invite our next speaker, um, Hank Wei Zen. Uh, he's an associate professor at the Aerospace Information Research Institute, Chinese okay. Academy of Sciences. Okay. He's the core member of the CropWatch Cloud Platform, yeah. um, China's leading crop monitoring system since 1998, and a member of the executive committee of the GeoGlam. He traveled yeah, okay. the furthest okay. for okay. this okay. event, um, all the way from China. Uh, and I hope the jet lag is tolerable. So, uh, Hongwei, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone. I'm um, actually, uh, it is my honor to be invited here to discuss uh, how to use Earth observation technology for food security. Uh, I'm uh, Hongwei Zhen from, uh, uh, from uh, CropWatch Unit, uh, Aerospace Information Research Institute, Chinese Academic of Science. Today is my pleasure to uh, give one presentation uh, advanced uh, in global crop monitoring crop watch on behalf of our team. Actually, my colleague Dr. Miao is also uh, on the line. 
Uh, my presentation is divided into four parts. The first is the background. Uh, and uh, the, story is, the story starts from uh, uh, geogram. And actually, Inbo also talk a little about uh, what is the geogram. Uh, and actually, uh, the geogram uh, is launched uh, in 2011 by the 20 minister, ministers. Uh, the embassy is to, uh, uh, and the G20 launched the geogram and the embassy uh, in the same time. And geogram uh, tried to use the Earth observation to provide relevant, timely, and accurate information on agricultural production for AMIS. And, and that information can assist the policy making of marketing. So actually, uh, geogram is uh, one of flagship of, uh, of a geo. And how to improve the agricultural monitoring transparency is a big mission of uh, Geogram. And actually, Copper Watch is a co-sponsor and uh, activity contributor of Geogram. So, uh, so another, uh, another, uh, another is uh, uh, SDG2, Zero Hungry. So actually, uh, everybody know uh, in, 2000, in 2015, the UN proposed uh, sustainable development goals. And zero hunger is a, a critical component of, uh, uh, of, of SDGs. Uh, and, uh, uh, and actually, by, uh, by 2013, all countries in the world should uh, achieve the zero hunger goals. Uh, and actually, the timely and uh, accuracy in uh, agricultural information can help limit the abnormal changes in agriculture, put other rights, and help to achieve the zero hunger goals. So, uh, so the Earth observation uh, play a critical role in uh, in uh, assessing the agricultural information. So, this is a uh, second background of us. So, uh, the second part of our, uh, 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 my presentation is the cloud cloud platform. Um, uh, cloud platform kicked off in 1997, and it is a satellite based. Uh, he actual methodology of uh, crop monitoring, uh, including uh, agroclimatic and agronomic and area yield and production information at different spatial scales. And the crop cloud problem consists of uh, four components, uh, including the crop pro. And the crop pro is a, a system to generate the, the monitoring information. And second component is the crop explore. The Cobalt Explore is a WebGIS-based uh, web system to, sh uh, to share the agricultural inf information for public. And third uh, component is the Cobalt Project. And this is a collaborative uh, analysis platform. Uh, the users can based on the platform to, to integrate the, the information from uh, Cobalt Pro to the owner uh, analysis. And the last is the uh, corporate booting, and this booting we are, uh, and actually uh, each three months we will release our monitoring result in the website. Um, so, uh, so actually, uh, corporate has developed a series of modules to access and monitoring our culture information such as the uh, agroclimatic and agronomic production and earning warning information. So this is, uh, this is the list of a model of us. And uh, all group watch modules are, de are deploy deployed in the Alibaba cloud. Uh, so this is very easy to access and use to do the uh, agricultural monitoring. But, but this model is uh, uh, restricted by data source and uh, regions. So how to do it? We integrated, uh, uh, we upgraded uh, uh, the model, of, uh, uh, model to APIs that, that can uh, overcome the implementation of data and the regions. So Cobalt developed a, a set of APIs for users to snake the data to perform the crop monitoring by core APIs, so which is le less dependent on the hardware and the technologies. So this, uh, this is a case study of uh, used APIs to the uh, crop uh, condition monitoring by, by, by core APIs. Uh, and actually, uh, Coport provides uh, uh, some unique uh, products for, product, for uh, public. Uh, this example of uh, rain-fed and irrigated uh, data produced by us. And, thi and this data can help, the, uh, can help, the, uh, can help to uh, assist uh, the food security and the, and the water security together. 
And uh, now the unique data is the uh, crop area land fraction data. And this data is, uh, uh, is 10 days productive. And the CARF provides uh, valuable information for crop area estimation and uh, crop condition assessment. And now uh, it is linked to the hand-in-hand uh, -hand platform of FAO. And another unique, uh, unique product of us is uh, cropping intensity. Uh, crop intensity means how many times uh, arable land uh, is planted or harvested in a year, and play a very important role in food security and uh, potential of crop product, productive, uh, crop productive uh, assessment. Uh, another very really unique, uh, unique indicator of us is, uh, uh, is a crop producing indicator. And based on this indicator, we can, uh, we can uh, estimate uh, how it change of our production uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming months. For example, uh, the, the, green, the green means the crop production may, may be become bad, and uh, the red color means the crop production may be below the averages. And, uh, uh, and the crop production released uh, agriculture uh, analysis bulletins to the public every three months through oversight. So this is all over, 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 oversight uh, uh, address. And anyone can access the uh, agricultural information and the analysis result in a free and easy way. And that provides uh, uh, another way to use the agricultural information for policy makings. Uh, so, uh, so actually, uh, uh, every year, uh, Coopwatch uh, publishes, publishes global crop production and uh, outlook on support of uh, China GEO. And uh, any report covers the highlight uh, evidence uh, uh, affecting the food security, the annual summary of a global uh, agriculture monitoring, and the food security of the log. So, uh, so, uh, so everybody can access the, uh, the report from, uh, from that website address. Uh, the, the third component is the capacity building of a watch. So this is really important for us. So, uh, so why we do this work? Uh, actually, uh, the purpose of us is uh, Make sure uh, to, to assure leave no, no one behind on the way to achieve zero hungry goals. So this is very important for developing countries. And, uh, and, and the principles of us so is to teach a man to fish rather than give a fish direct to them. So I think this is very important. For example, uh, for example if the youth, youth uh, uh, master the skills, do the monitoring, that can benefit the countries. So I think this is really important. And actually, the, agric the agriculture, uh, the agriculture um, uh, information is very really sensitive. So we have three uh, principles. The first is prove the uh, ownership. And the second is respect the privacy of information. For example, for, for, the, institute, for the institute data, this is time and money consumed, and it's very really sensitive. So, I, so we should respect the, the privacy of information. And the last is respect the, respect the, the concern sensitives. So, uh, so actually, uh, Corporate project provides three ways to conduct uh, uh, capacity buildings. The first way, uh, uh, the first way is to provide APIs to access to all, all functions of agriculture indicator, and allow the users to build their own agriculture monitoring system in local languages, and then conduct uh, agriculture monitoring independently. Uh, we, we actually we do this work in Mozambique and uh, and uh, Cambodia, and second way. Uh, some countries have their own systems. So how to do the capital building? We provide the data and the information access port for users to follow the requirements. So the users can integrate the agricultural monitoring information from us into the system of them, and then do the own uh, uh, agricultural monitoring uh, 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 monitoring. Uh, this is a case study from Thailand. And the last, uh, and the last way is uh, Another way is to build the stand on a system for users according to the, or, to the requirements and hand it all to the users after several training courses. This is a case study from Mongolia. Uh, this is a case study from, uh, uh, from Mozambique. Uh, it, it is a very successful, it, it's very successful uh, stories of us. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, this work, we get support for, okay, we get support by, uh, by, by CWFP. And after uh, after a face-to-face -face, uh, discussed, we we confirmed uh, 
uh, the required document and, and the activities. And after uh, several training courses for, the, uh, for Mozambique, and we teach them how to do the uh, in-situ data generations, how to operate the systems, and how to do the uh, analysis, and then, uh, and then how to use the APIs to do the own monitoring. And, uh, and the colleagues from, uh, uh, from Mozambique and master skills and do the own crop, uh, crop condition monitoring. And actually, they, they put the uh, crop uh, condition information to the national meteorological uh, bulletins. So this is uh, so this is a comment from uh, Mozambique. As they said, we used the uh, co mainly for co production forecasting, and our team uh, had been applied to, to generate uh, mostly agricultural buildings during the rain season. And we should inform policy making at the national and uh, provincial levels agriculture departments. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, we also do the same work in the Cambodia. We translate the interface from English to Cambodian language, so the users from Cambodia can understand how to use the systems. And this is some tra training course on the support from, uh, from UN Skype. We, uh, we, we made a video for the users from Cambodia, so they, so they can follow the videos to understand how to use our systems. And this is the case study from, uh, uh, from Thailand. And actually, Thailand has a uh, 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 agricultural system named the uh, Agri Map. And actually, uh, each time the Agri Map uh, 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 sends the requirement to us and let us to produce necessary remote sensing information for them. And then they integrate the information into the Agri Map system, do the crop yield and the crop condition by, by, uh, by, uh, by Thailand. And this work also we get support from uh, UN Skype. And last case study is uh, uh, Mongolia. And actually, the drought is really uh, is really uh, big issues in Mongolia. And uh, uh, and after three years uh, hard working, we develop a drought watch uh, for Mongolia, and then hand over the drought watch to Mong um, to the National Remote Sensing of Mongolia. And now the colleagues from uh, Mongolia use the system do the drought monitoring and release the information for, uh, for, uh, for livestock and uh, weather and, uh, and the tourism. The last is uh, outlook. So, uh, so, 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 how, so, how, so how to do next step? And, uh, and, and I think uh, it's very important to share, the, to share the modules, APIs, and data source to users. So because the initially import operation cost as well as the Eric uh, technical skill uh, limited the delivery country to set up operation and um, maintain crop monitoring systems. So for us, uh, the all component and functions, uh, including the self cal uh, calibration ability of models and the cl collaboratory analysis of indicator, we also package as APIs in the corporate cloud for users and the tailors, so that they can call the APIs and then to, uh, to create the system by owner, and then do the owner monitoring. So this is our story from uh, Cobalt. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Hongwei. Um, really nice examples of um, how you guys make in remote sensing data uh, more accessible to users. Um, I also truly like uh, the continuing messaging and promoting ownership in the countries and building capacity uh, about using this uh, EO data and analytics. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker uh, uh, was not able to join, unfortunately, as I mentioned at the start. Um, instead, he sent us his video because he was in the field today. So he was not sure his plane would be back on time. Um, so we have a video from him, uh, and then he'll be available for Q&A. He just texted us that he actually landed. Um, so the next speaker is Charles Mwangi. He is the Agriculture Director um, at the Space Sector and Technology Development um, at the Kenya Space Agency, where he's overseeing Earth observation and research projects on the development of EO applications for different thematic areas, including agriculture, as well as overseeing the implementation of the research grant program at Kenya as Space Agency. So he'll talk about the experience of Kenya in deploying the EO data for food security monitoring. Yeah, we can start. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Charles Mongi, the Acting Director of Space Technology Development of the Kenya Space Agency. I'm going to share a few of our activities that we are undertaking at the Kenya Space Agency. Uh, we regards supporting the agricultural sector uh, in the country. Uh, again, I want to take this opportunity to thank the World Bank for having uh, extended this invitation to us. Um, and again, for the continuous engagement that we've been having with uh, the team on how we can move this conversation on using our observation uh, forward. So I start by giving uh, a brief overview of the Kenya Space Agency. We were established in um, in, in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, and our mandate is essentially to promote and coordinate, uh, as well as regulating the space sector in the country. And the reason why we established was to better coordinate the sector, because the feeling then was uh, there was a lot of disjointed activities within the sector, and there was a need to have an agency that would help consolidate all the efforts that were being done within uh, the sector. So one of our key drivers has been to engage the stakeholders to better understand what their needs are, so that now as we fashion our, our solutions or our products, then we have a better understanding of their requirements. And we do that using um, different forums, uh, and, and one of those is um, convening meetings and forums where uh, we get to hear from them or they get to share among their peers. Uh, I will give a few examples, the ones listed there, uh, the stakeholder forum that we had in 2021. We had um, the MATIC on agriculture, and the intention then was, because again, the care space agency was young then, was to better understand what kind of support uh, the sector needed uh, from us, yeah. as well as other, uh, from the other sectors. Uh, in 2022, we had, last year, we, in June, we had what we were calling the Kenya Space Expo and Conference. It was a hybrid event uh, where we had exhibition space and also a conference. We had a whole um, session that was dedicated in agriculture, again, to better understand and to allow the sector players uh, to share what they were doing. Uh, last year, again, in December, we supported an initiative that we felt was important for our sector. Uh, especially to trying to drive uh, the growth of, of startups and the private sector companies who are venturing into agri-tech. Uh, it, it was an Africa-wide initiative. And I think it was an honor for us, Kenya, because we hosted the meeting event during the Kenya Innovation Week, uh, to have a Kenyan company selected as, uh, as the first as winner, uh, Agribora, and, and maybe a few of you have had engagement with them. We are proud of them. And then we also want to use that as an opportunity of also uh, engaging the, uh, the young people to get into the sector. And again, later this, this um, uh, early, early June, we are also uh, planning an event uh, in collaboration with the Regional Center of um, Working of Resources for Development. Uh, and the intention is to bring together stakeholders together so that we are able to understand what their needs are and what they are currently doing and see where we are able to fit in. So currently of those forums, we have picked a few items or a few discussion points uh, that essentially have been driving what we currently do at the agency. One of the issues we've noted is uh, around the, the geospatial data. Uh, how accessible is it? How findable is it? Is it in a format that can be operated on using maybe AI or machine learning or any other GIS software. So there is that need to put that data in a format that is usable. And of course, when you're dealing with data, again, the data infrastructure is also quite important. The hardware, do we have the servers, do we have the compute, do we also have the softwares to be able to process that information and usable insights. Uh, and of course, now again, the next step is to do we have the requisite capacity, one, to, to handle the hardware a bit, second one, to develop the, uh, working on the software, and then the third one, 
developing solutions on top of that. Uh, again, I mentioned the element why we established the element of coordination. But again, we also see the need for sustainability because we have seen a lot of pilots that do not go beyond the end date. And we're trying to see how, as a sector, uh, also as a space agency, we can come in and support them. But again, also try and see whether we can develop systems where pilots could easily fit in. So that again, again, we build on a system that is sustainable in the long term and would continue to be improved as we go along so that pilots plug in into this. Of course, there is need for investment in research. Uh, and we're looking at the indigenous capability because we're also trying to avoid a scenario where we have tanky projects where the user is brought for a product and they have no understanding of what and how it was developed. And if we develop it internally or locally, then there is a higher chance that the, the users will better understand and even the support will be locally available for that particular initiative. Of course, the impact is important because we say technology exists to solve, solu uh, provide solutions to our societal need. When we stop doing that and we start doing research for the sake of doing research, then we miss out an important element where we are bound to have the impact. And I'll talk a bit more on what we have one of the engagement we have with one of the organizations later. So I just wanted to highlight one of the projects that we have um, been engaged in, uh, uh, which we initiated, uh, called the Monitoring for Information and Decision Using Space Technology. Uh, we benefited from our work from the uh, GEO, uh, Group on Earth Observation and GEE. And the reason why we felt this was important is we were keen to leverage on free and open source data. There was a study that was done in Kenya in 2016 by uh, uh, UNDP. And one of the issues that were raised was around the items that I mentioned. There was an issue on uh, data availability. There was an issue on software. And we were hoping that we could easily, we can leverage on the, uh, on the data sets that are available on Google Earth Engine to build a case for utilizing and developing solutions on, on such platform. So we were using Google Earth Engine. So we've already done uh, three projects. Uh, the last one is almost uh, being completed. So we've done forest uh, mapping on the other days. We did urbanization, urban, uh, urban mapping uh, for the Nakuru municipality. Uh, we also did, we are currently completing one on uh, floods uh, covering the lower Tana basin. We also did a test case for sugarcane mapping with the Agriculture Food, Food Authority in Kenya. And the other conversation we are having, and I mentioned that later, is with NASA Harvest on how we can use Google Earth Engine and some of the tools that they develop to develop cross mask and crop type for the country. And also, potentially, also uh, do validation for some of the products that have been done for the country. So, one of the things, or one of the initiatives that is a key flagship for us is the Data Hub. Uh, which has three components. There is a data portal, there is a data cube, and the knowledge hub. So the data portal is essentially an aggregation of data. But I'm just using here an example of the data that we're trying to aggregate for, for aggregator. Uh, and we're subsetting the global data sets to Kenya. And then we're also going to have conversation with the different stakeholders and see what data sets are available. We would also be happy to uh, host or to point out um, any other data sets that will be available, like the ones that are, that are being worked on by the Ministry of Agriculture. But again, because we support the whole sector, we hope to have a bit of uh, data sets from the different sectors that the different stakeholders will potentially use or need to develop uh, the applications. But the reason why we're developing this is also to in support of startups in the private sector so that they have an, um, um, a portal where even if they were to build the applications, they would be sure that their data, or if they are pointing their APIs to a data portal, that that data would continue to be available into the, into the long term. The data cube, again, leveraging on the potential of consolidated data sets, and then now using what I commonly referred to as Jupyter Notebooks, where you are able to run scripts without necessarily having to download the data sets on the portal. And we have um, few test cases that we have been able to do, and we are trying to still stress testing. 
And we've learned from the other initiatives, like the Digital Lab Africa initiative. Uh, but again, we felt it was important for us to have customized local solutions. And again, what we're looking at is again connecting it, um, uh, connecting the data cube and the data portal to a HPC so that now the analysis becomes much more speedy. We have had another a number of initiatives uh, with the different stakeholders involved in the agriculture uh, value chain. Um, again, like I mentioned, we work closely with, with the user stakeholder. In this case, the main stakeholder is the Ministry of Agriculture in Kenya. And we've been working with the Directorate of Research and Innovation uh, who are helping coordinate what we're calling the Data Transformation Committee, uh, where we have different uh, working groups. Uh, the Kenya Space Agency is helping coordinate the, the environmental, uh, environment and satellite data working group uh, under the Data Think Tank initiative. And the idea is to see how we can bring in, uh, we can bring together the different stakeholders who have some satellite data or working on satellite data or environmental data. See whether we can consolidate that and make it available to the agricultural sector. I mentioned these earlier, the NASA harvest engagement, where we're trying to develop the crop mass, crop type products. And I know there was an early presentation earlier by NASA harvest uh, team. And then the other uh, engagement we're looking forward to the coming month is, is a collaboration between Brady and other place uh, and a local stakeholder called uh, Specialty. And the intention is to try it and see whether we can develop uh, label data sets uh, by collecting high resolution drone imagery and then that data set will potentially be used for AI and machine learning training. Um, uh, and we are hoping that that would also help us in terms of uh, adding more data sets that can be used, more especially for as we see the evolution of technology going towards the AI. The other conversation, and I also alluded to this earlier with CGR, is to try and see how can we um, uh, roll out some of the research initiatives uh, that have already been done. Uh, because there has been a lot of work that has been done, but that research has not evolved into usable uh, solutions, if I might call them that, to the users. And the conversation we're having with CGI is to try and see how we can move this research to the users. And we are we are working together with one of the uh, counties in Kenya. Kenya, we have agriculture is a devolved function, and one of the counties is is the one that we're working with. And we're trying to see how we can work, especially on all these projects that I mentioned, uh, to have that as a pilot county and see whether we can consolidate all these efforts and develop a system or a product or uh, or something that the users in this particular county can use and. And again, of course, there is also the conversation that we have with the users to understand what their needs are. So that now as we have the conversation with researchers to see what research would fit in or would plug in into this particular system. But again, we see a lot of opportunities for the, uh, for the different players who are involved in that process. And we're saying this is only the beginning of the conversation and we are happy to see how that would, uh, how this evolves. I want to end with yeah. Again, because of the limited time, I, I again want to thank the World Bank for having extended this uh, invitation to us. Uh, on my closing slide, I have one of, again, the other initiative that we are involved in that is supposed to help us get more data from using satellite imagery. Uh, we recently launched the Taifa One uh, satellite, and uh, we are currently working on another initiative where we'll have a climate camera that will be hosted at the International Space Station uh, courtesy of another initiative by the by UNOSA and the Airbus. And the reason why we are doing all this is to try and see how best we can support the sector. Agriculture is the backbone of our, of our economy, and we see a lot of value in supporting it, and also in also creating more opportunities within the sector. And our observation is one of those sectors we see or we know that can enhance this conversation, especially also bringing in uh, the private sector and also startups uh, who are involved in agri-tech, try and drive more value from this conversation. I want to wish you the best as you continue this conversation. I look forward to uh, hearing your feedback. If you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out uh, to me on the email provided there. 
and I'm happy to carry this conversation forward. Again, thank you, all Bank, for having uh, invited the Space Agency to this discussion, and we look forward to continuing this discussion beyond this workshop. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Thank you very much to Charles for, uh, for sharing with us this insightful video and sharing uh, uh, on different initiatives that uh, Kenya Space Agency does. Uh, we are slightly behind the schedule, so without further ado, let me introduce our next presenter, um, Alexandra Horst. Um, she's a senior economist in the World Bank's Agriculture and Food Global Almost Practice, working on food security and food systems transformation. Alexandra leads the efforts around the Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard, which was launched in November 2022 um, as a resource and information sharing platform of the Global Alliance for Food Security. So today, Alex will talk about the initiative, the platform, and discuss how they're uh, deploying geospatial uh, data for their needs. Alex? Mm -hmm. yes, one second. One second. We are and while we're waiting for that, yeah, because there takes time to this switch from right? the video to presentation, um, just another uh, reminder to our uh, audience in line to the share the, the questions and for you uh, all in the audience to also think of some uh, questions to have a stimulating discussion after um, Alex is done. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Katarina. And it's almost lunchtime, but before that, it's my great pleasure to present the a global food and nutrition security dashboard to you. Um, as we've heard throughout this uh, event, food insecurity is on the rise. Uh, the latest global report on food crisis, which just came out a few weeks ago, earlier this month, uh, reports that uh, 258 million people in 58 countries are in phase, uh, IPC phase three and above. Um, this is the fourth consecutive year that this number is um, increasing and unfortunately also projections give a grim outlook on uh, the state of food security in the next few years. So when a food crisis hits, swift action is really critical. Um, however, such action is challenged by a few factors, including um, that a lot of acute and food and nutrition security uh, information is out there, but it's actually quite dispersed or on different website databases and so on. So that actually can slow uh, anticipatory action and decision making by um, policymakers. Um, also, there's a great variety in the uh, methodologies on how to monitor acute food insecurity, which can create uncertainty among donors in terms of uh, the, the global numbers on acute inf food insecure and then the need in terms of uh, financing. And then speaking of financing, uh, also, uh, while there are uh, very comprehensive retrospective uh, studies on the funding flows for food insecurity, actually existing systems that track up-to-date data on humanitarian and development finance uh, are um, sometimes incomplete or face challenges in getting the data in a consistent format, in particular for the development uh, finance. And so based on these challenges, um, the need for the Global Food and Nutrition Security Dashboard was identified last year uh, in response to the war in Ukraine and its impact on the global um, food insecurity crisis. And uh, so the dashboard um, is a one-stop publicly available platform um, to support early detection and inform a coordinated uh, response to emerging food insecurity crisis. It's an initiative that uh, was launched under the auspices of the Global Alliance for Food Security that you might have heard about, which was co-convened last year, almost to the date a year ago, um, by the uh, G7 and the World Bank Group, together with a lot of partners from the humanitarian and development um, space, including WFP, FAO, CGIR, other UN agencies, and then a variety of bilateral um, and uh, regional organizations as well as uh, donors. And so uh, last summer we spent about four months uh, getting the first iteration of the dashboard um, into place and we launched it uh, last November. And so just uh, to explain a bit what does it do, uh, the dashboard basically is a decision-making uh, support tool that collates the latest data on food security, acute food insecurity trends, and um, key nutrition um, indicators. 
It brings together information from existing uh, tracking systems of finance for food security and nutrition, and it also wants to highlight and showcase innovations such as um, the uh, initiatives you are working on uh, in order to improve resilience um, to future crises. Um, so the dashboard brings key indicators into a geospatial format, which actually allows decision makers to very easily detect uh, acute food and nutrition and security hotspots uh, and thereby anticipate and uh, track crisis, but also to identify gaps in data, the gaps in the system uh, that need to be addressed. And it basically in one place offers the ability to uh, switch between key indicators that have been selected by a technical working group um, on the respective um, topics that are highlighted in the dashboard. So I'll switch uh, to a quick live demo to the, of the dashboard. Let me just see if um, it works. Should be coming up on the screen with the ITS colleague in the background. Hopefully with switching to it. Let's maybe just give it one second. Oh, there we go, perfect. Great, let me see. Sorry, Alex, would you, because <laughs> it's on this monitor, I need to just have a look, apologies. <laughs> um, so this is, I'm just gonna focus very quickly on the map-based uh, sections of the dashboard. Uh, so basically here, as you can see, the, the default map is uh, IPC and Cadre Harmonisé data on the latest acute uh, food insecurity. Um, this is, uh, you know, data is pulled in through API, so once it's uh, updated uh, on the original source, uh, it's updated on the dashboard as well, and users can hover over uh, different countries, also go uh, into uh, countries to get where available information on the subnational data. Um, on the left here, we have um, different indicators on acute chronic um, uh, food insecurity as well as nutrition, and users can just basically switch between indicators and also get more information on source, methodology, and so on in, in one place uh, under the information uh, buttons. We also um, have a section, a map on uh, financing, humanitarian uh, funding, as well as development funding based on the um, UN OCHA financial tracking service um, and for development on the International Aid uh, Transparency Initiative, which gives a global overview for this year on the, the funds uh, spent. And then under what we call advance, uh, we're um, at the moment showing a map where there are uh, country level innovations and uh, research presented. We're actually working a bit on changing this also more on an indicator map, but the idea is to, to bring all of this information into a research uh, structure. Um, there's also a section uh, on country profiles where users can essentially find more details and visualizations of the indicators that are in the dashboard. Uh, so more on trends and uh, some more detail around the indicators. Uh, and for example, for financing also uh, look back at different years and uh, find a bit more information on the donors. Um, so that was just a very quick overview uh, of the, the map-based um, portions. We do have um, a resources section where we're actually linking to already a few of the um, initiatives that were presented today, and today was very inspirational about uh, adding more. So I look forward to uh, reviewing basically the, the program and connecting with you to make sure that we can um, highlight um, the work that is being done here. Okay, I guess switching back to the PowerPoint, let me see. Just for my last two slides. How do I go back? <laughs> Sorry. That's the fun of the live presentation, just this. Yeah, perfect, okay, great. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, just a few um, facts since uh, the launch about six months ago. So um, at the moment we're sharing uh, data sets based on a consensus-based approach with the over 
60 partners that are uh, active in the Global Alliance for Food Security. We have about 40 of them who are actively sharing data or have recommended data um, in the different areas that are displayed on the dashboard. Um, and we continue adding new resources based on a consensus-based approach in terms of identifying and prioritizing the resources. Um, we have um, tracking, we're tracking the users of the dashboard, finding that um, as intended, we're uh, getting a, a more geographic diversity in the type of users, as well as higher retention in terms of users coming back to the dashboard, using it for a longer time. Um, and, you know, obviously always tracking that in order to improve its, its utility. Um, the dashboard has been mentioned in several, um, you know, high-level statements as well as strategies. Uh, most recently, in the Hiroshima Action Statement uh, for Resilient Glo Global Food Security, which uh, came out just of the uh, G7 summit just last weekend. Um, and as I was saying before, we're continuously working on improving the dashboard. This was a very fast-tracked activity to uh, get into the public. We know there will be several iterations in order to, um, you know, make it more complete and add resources. So we really uh, are doing an active outreach in order to have more partnerships um, to make sure that this really becomes a one-stop shop for information available on food and nutrition security, as well as improving uh, information on resilience for future crises. Um, so a few examples we're working on uh, at the moment is, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the global report on food crisis just came out a few weeks ago, and uh, they're using the dashboard now actually as sort of the interactive map to visualize the, uh, the information in the GRFC. So we're at the moment integrating that into the dashboard, and uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks you should see the different GRFC um, maps in terms of prevalence, but also drivers of acute uh, food insecurity. We're also working on a module uh, around the food security crisis preparedness plans that you might know about, which is an initiative um, to be more active at the country level and support countries uh, in order to uh, create systems for um, for um, recognizing and um, uh, mobilizing early action when a, a crisis hits. So this is also done in partnership with the, with the Global Alliance partners. And the idea for the dashboard is to be the tracking tool uh, for the development of those uh, plans, but also once they're activated, if the process is being uh, followed and if um, funding can be mobilized through the um, through the convening power of the, of the Global Alliance. Um, and as I mentioned already, we're always looking for new innovations and, uh, and key initiatives. So um, as I was mentioning also, it's very inspirational to be here today. I already have my team uh, working on making sure that a lot of the work uh, you're doing is being uh, discussed in the technical working group to see um, how to add it to the dashboard. And obviously, if you have any recommendations, uh, ideas, and feedback, uh, please talk to me today or just send us an email at our, um, uh, on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. So speakers in our first session um, reinforce the importance of building partnerships, and I think Alex can really elaborate on building productive and effective partnerships in the context of the dashboard. So thanks again. Um, now we can move to our discussion part and the Q&A session. Um, we have a couple of questions online, but I wanted to see first if there are any questions in the audience that uh, will help us start the Q&A session. And I realize it's just uh, 15 minutes away from our lunch, but let's just stay a little bit longer on this. Anybody? Go ahead, Bruno. This is um, a general question I'd love to, anyone can pick it up. Today, not only in this session, we've heard um, overlapping services and overlapping sources of information. And I wonder what's your take of, I'm a, imagine I'm a task team leader who doesn't know much about Earth observation. How do I discover these things? How do I choose between World Serial of ESA that I know and Crop Watch from the colleagues in China, how, because I'm sure each has its advantages, how, how to go about that? How can we improve 
what uh, what Alex you were mentioning the the first phases of the of your role, which is to raise awareness of these of these possibilities. It seems now we have a lot of options, but then it seems hard to choose among them. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Bruno, for your uh, great question. And indeed, I think that's that's been an equation tough to solve um, because we cannot expect that each TDL, so is each uh, project manager, in a sense, uh, will spend too much time. Those people are very busy. They have so much on their plate, and they don't have time to spend a week to explore, describe, and, and in the end, I think there is different angles that should be taken to solve this issue. First, it's, of course, to produce the documentation, internal documentation at the bank, and to have the right people in the right units that can play this translation role. So that's part of my job to do this translation. It's part of yours, probably. Um, and, and I would invite any global practice at the World Bank to staff uh, themselves and, and recruit a few of those people like the agriculture uh, global practice did. Uh, because as you are mentioning, the, I, I think that we've been for a while overselling and underusing those technologies um, because it's more complicated than people think to actually implement them for many different reasons and it comes down to two things first it's complicated and also the world bank is a bank right it's not the one implementing and so you have an additional layer of complexity which is that uh, the lending operation is implemented by another stakeholder uh, so if you take into account those two big obstacle um, not obstacles but i would say uh, hurdles to to overcome uh, then it means that you need to recruit the, the right people to recruit the right people to play this translation role and to kind of produce the right documentation and prac like best practices uh, to follow if you want to integrate that's that's what i would take so doing prototypes is great uh, but having the capacity building skills transfer part as, as much internally as externally is also very important, I think. Yeah, maybe just from the, like from the experience of the, the dashboard and, and how to, like what data we're putting on the dashboard, not necessarily specific to EO data, but uh, rather on these different methodologies on acute food insecurity. So. Uh, the approach we've taken is basically to be very transparent about the differences of the different uh, data sources. Um, so that's why you have information <laughs> buttons all over. Um, but we're also working in order to um, help a little bit users to interpret, right? Because, I mean, we can put the methodology out there. We'll have a methodology uh, note um, for all the information that is on the dashboard. But, um, you know, I think there also needs to be a bit of uh, guidance on where the advantages and disadvantages and what situations of the different uh, data does it um, display. But, of course, you know, there's obviously also a lot of uh, discussion around, um, you know, which methodology uh, is uh, better than another. But uh, at least for the acute food insecurity, thankfully, we have sort of the gold standard of the, of the IPC or equivalent. Uh, and that's why also we're aligned with the, the global report on food crisis for that. But it's, yeah, definitely a challenge we've, we've also encountered with, you know, the variety of indicators that are out there. And you don't want to overwhelm users either by just dumping everything in, in one place without any, any guidance. Thank you so much, Alex and Alex. Um, so we have a couple of questions um, from online. Um, we have two for Hongwei. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I didn't hear. Yeah, I, 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 I want to talk, uh, talk more. Uh, and actually, uh, Coport has a lot of uh, methodology and uh, many indicators. So, so actually, you know, uh, for, for special regions, to have some, you know, we should sneak what, what is the best indicator and best uh, module for special regions. So for, for, our, uh, for our philosophies like this, we provide the methodology. This means we share the modules and the APIs for the UDS, and then let the UDS integrate the local knowledge, of, uh, uh, knowledge into the modules, snake her, snake her favorite data and uh, into the module, do the owner our culture monitoring. So I think this is the best way. You know, the, the geography is really, 
it, 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 the geography has a very strong, uh, had a very strong uh, different uh, skills and different, uh, uh, he, uh, 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 has strong spatial heat, uh, heat, heat, heat grid. So the best way is to provide the methodology for them and let them do the monitoring, use the, the own data and, and the local knowledge. Thank you so much. Um, and this is actually a good start into the, um, my next question. So we had two for, for you, uh, Hongwei, and the one was from Nigeria. Um, and I think uh, you kind of answered it, but I wanted to double check. So he's asking if there is a detailed technical background on the indicators that you've been showing um, for CropWatch. Um, uh, some are well known, but others not really. And uh, so he would like to know as this would allow for an informed evaluation of, of the outputs. And another question also on CropWatch is um, uh, on the data contribution are all, are you using the data of all G20 countries um, and is the data, um, and it's an open access data. Uh, and then there was question on whether you have any case studies on India that you would like to mention upon. Sorry, these are many, you don't have to answer all, but just touch upon which ones you find. Uh, 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 I, I also Uh, I see the first question from uh, uh, ma ma uh, from uh, uh, Mario, right? uh, and the, and and his uh, uh, is detail uh, detail te uh, technical background of uh, indicator was. Yes, actually we published a lot of papers, and we released the all paper in all of such. Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, if you have some interest, in you can visit all such to to get the all. Paper, and actually, in each quarter bulletins of watch, we also uh, uh, briefly introduced uh, what's in the, what is the indicator used uh, in these bulletins, and what's the methodologies, and what's the data we use, so you can get uh, all information from our website. This is the first question, and this is uh, uh, the second question is from uh, uh, from uh, India friends. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> uh, the first. Uh, no, uh, no, no. Actually, the, the minister of G20 launched the Geogram and the Amis together, and the Corp Watch is a contributor to Geogram. No, say, no, say G20 shared that to us. No. And uh, and uh, 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 and actually, the all data and information generated by uh, Corp Watch are released in all uh, on all in on all our site, and uh, anyone can access the information and it's out uh, fr uh, free. The, second, uh, the, the third question is very interesting. Do you have any case study on India? Uh, not yet. And everyone knows India is a big country. And India has uh, its own agriculture monitoring systems. No need for capacity buildings. And uh, I, I can say uh, uh, five years ago, I have students from India. <laughs> That's all. And, uh, uh, and the most important uh, corporate watch is to teach a man to fish no say give a to, to them directly. So we provide APIs and, uh, and the training courses for users. And then the users understand how to use the module to do the owner, uh, uh, do the owner uh, monitoring independently. So this is all. Yeah. Thank you so much, thanks. Uh, a lot of interest in your work, uh, so many questions. Any additional questions from the audience here that you have for our speakers? I have a question for yeah, Charles, actually, who I think is online, right? Um, yeah, I think so. You, you talked about, um, the, so I'm Lucas, I work in uh, the team that organizes this conference, but you mentioned um, the, the collaboration with Radiant Earth and um, that you're building on building ground truth data. So we, as we were discussing this earlier, I would be curious to hear more about like what kind of data is this going to be, crop types or, or anything else, that would be cool. Thank you. Charles, if you're online. Julia, Charles online? Yeah, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm online. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you, you. Lucas, so for, thank you, Lucas, for that. Question. Um, so what you're looking at with the region and plan is to uh, do boundary level and then also uh, for buildings as well. So we're looking, but essentially also we will also use that for the, for the different crop types. Crop types and um, uh, crop and land crop as well. 
So we will col collect as much data sets we will be able to, uh, to get from the ground and then be able to, uh, to label all the data sets because we plan to use that data for, uh, for besides even crop uh, doing human settlement as well. Uh, because essentially all the data sets that we'll be able to receive, uh, again, we like we that we will be using a drone to do that. And then use, uh, again, high resolution imagery would allow us to be able to have um, clear, be able to delineate the boundaries for the different uh, the different crops. So that the area that you selected has a variety of, uh, of different crops and different uh, features. And you're hoping to use that, and I, again, based on that experience, we'll be able to see how that will go. I don't know, I hope that answers your question, Lucas. Um, yeah, he shows that he's satisfied with the answer. Thanks so much. Um, unless there are any more questions in the audience or online, I would like, yeah, go ahead, Isha Ray. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, this is a question for uh, CropWatch. It's just that uh, I'm curious, and, and, I'm, and I apologize if you've covered this. Um, so is CropWatch um, an interface for like the APIs that the CropWatch has um, that allows to perform case studies on different regions. Um, does it also provide tools like um, you know AI or machine learning tools that are integrated with the APIs so that um, people can uh, do their own forecasting, or is it just for? Is it only uh, a visualization uh, platform? And with that being asked, if you have APIs that are reference that that are that allow people to use different data. Would you use a standardized, um, let's say, a machine learning model or a standardized uh, AI model, or would you have different models that would accommodate for different regions and different kinds of data? Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, uh, yes, I uh, actually uh, actually for Mozambique they used the APIs of us to to do the uh, crop or condition assessment by themselves. Uh, and second, uh, for the AI technology, so this is very interesting uh, topic. So you know, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, in the uh, in the agriculture remote sensing monitoring, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning and AI technology used for crop type mappings and crop yield forecastings. And uh, we also uh, use uh, use a lot of uh, that uh, technologies. And uh, uh, last year we last year we develop uh, apps for public. And this public we uh, we uh, we use a smart mobile phone to take a photo for wheat and the rice, and then to and then to count to count the uh, uh, the number of uh, the, the number of uh, of headlings, and to predict the yield. And uh, uh, in next uh, in next month in, in, in the June, uh, I will uh, I will introduce this tool to public in Geneva. So uh, so uh, so if you have some testing, we can talk more uh, in the long term. Thank you so much. Any more questions? Then I have the last closing one, not to keep you too long away from the lunch. Um, and that would be directed to um, Alex Chune and then also Charles on the receiving side and then anybody else who wants to step in. And that is on the capacity building. So you guys are doing a lot of capacity building, um, a lot of initiatives in Kenya also on the capacity building. So any reflections on what really works? What are some key elements you think that are absolutely necessary in developing that capacity to use EO data and analytics in the countries to achieve the sustainable use of these products. Thank you. So I'll I'll go first, Charles, if you if you don't mind. Um, so, indeed, I th I think the the question of capacity building has been key, and this is really something we've tried to progressively improve as we've moved along the phases of the ESA World Bank partnership and, and the different programs that were mobilized by the European Space Agency. Um, the first thing I think, and that's what we, one of the first lessons that we understood is that 
in, in this partnership, uh, the capacity building is best managed on the side of the IFI, so on the side of the, of the, of the World Bank, and in close collaboration with um, the beneficiary countries and the beneficiary institutions. And we've tried progressively to move away from those programs that are focusing potentially on, on five people within a unit to something that is a bit more holistic. Not that the first part that I just mentioned should be done, but that we, we need to innovate and try to find new innovative models to do capacity building and to try to generate ecosystem in those countries. Because what we're really trying to aim at is not necessarily to aim for people that then might move out of a unit and then you need to either retrain or, or start from scratch, but really generate an ecosystem and a sustainable ecosystem in, this in those countries of institutions that use uh, this information, but also stakeholders and private stakeholders that somehow provide some of the services or complement some of it, right? And, and one quick example, because I don't want to be too long, but one quick example that I would like to mention is the um, project and the program of the Resilience Academy, uh, which actually might become soon Digital Earth Academies. And, and this program really aims at training generations, literally. Uh, in, that's a collaboration with local universities, and that happened in Tanzania, and that aims at really training generations of students that are proficient in the use, for example, of Earth observation. And then support them not only uh, by providing them the knowledge, but including them in using microtasking to do labeling tasks, to training data collection, and then even support them potentially in the creation of their own company. And some of these people would get recruited locally, some of these people would create their own companies. And that's a whole new idea, and, and, and I would say model, to doing the capacity building and creating, creating an ecosystem locally that you can rely on, on to, to transfer some tools to and, and more importantly, I think, and I'll with, end with this word, to co-create and co-design uh, those tools based on local participation. So I think uh, that's what we're moving towards and, and trying to, in addition to potentially the more traditional ways to doing capacity building and aiming at a specific unit within a specific ministry, having these kind of more holistic approaches. Thank you so much. Charles, any inputs from your side? Yes, thank you, Catalina. Um, we are trying um, what I would say a new model, if I might use the term new model, in terms of how we're engaging uh, with our stakeholders, especially in terms of capacity building, because one of the issues that we've realized, and that has come also, um, has, has become prevalent, especially within the agriculture sector, is one of the questions that we get asked uh, as the agency is we have so many solutions out there, which ones do we use? And the approach that we decided to use is where we work with the stakeholder to identify what solutions they want to develop, or we share with them what could potentially be developed. And then we sit together and agree um, on a pilot project what they would want to see developed. And then we work through that process of developing together. Because one of the other issues, and I maybe alluded to that during the presentation, is that when you have a solution that you have no idea how it has been developed, the chances of you utilizing that uh, for you to develop solutions or to develop, uh, to, to be able to come up with decisions and policies, especially for government, is a bit difficult. Uh, and that is why we have decided to explore that sort of capacity building. One of the other challenges, and maybe I can mention that, is the evolution of technology has seen new, new technologies coming to the fore. But most of the institutions you're working with, especially from uh, um, the, this region, is they, they do not have dedicated officers who their day job is to say, uh, say the DIS officers. Uh, when you go to the Ministry of Agriculture, you might not have that that kind of people. So even if they are trained, once they go back to the institutions, they go and go back to their daily job. And that is one of the gaps that we potentially have to explore how also with stakeholders see how we can encourage these institutions to have dedicated people who once they get, get trained, then they can evolve into supporting or being able to continue delivering the products. So one of the other things that we're exploring to do, and I mentioned about the data portal, is to create that centralized area where uh, government institutions have are sure that they are getting credible data and information. 
And the reason why we're doing that is also to create another pipeline for startups and private companies to build solutions on top. And again, also engage with the stakeholders. So again, in, in, in wrapping it up, because I know it's a bit, uh, it's almost your lunch time, is we have to rethink how we have previously done. Some of the pilots have been good, but how sustainable are they? So when you do capacity building on a solution that is costing a um, uh, couple of uh, thousands of, of dollars, then how does that evolve over? So if, even if you build capacity, that solution might not be uh, be, uh, be onboarded by the user, and, and we have to look at that component as we go along. I mean, I, I just wrap it up from there, uh, but I'm happy to continue the conversation even offline. Thank you so much, Charles, for such an elaborate answer. Um, and uh, thank you once again to all our speakers for, for the today's sessions, for the informative session and for the, for the discussion. Uh, with this, I am uh, closing this session and invite all of you to lunch, uh, which is provided outside. Uh, so we'll come back at 1.45, uh, and then we'll have two sessions uh, featuring um, organizations that are doing some groundbreaking work in um, leveraging AI and EO for food security uh, monitoring. Thank you so much. <laughs>